Revolt Talk Shows is back. Unleashed, unabridged, uncensored, and unbelievable. Only on Sputnik Radio. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. This is London, but broadcasting to you, of course, all over the world online, thanks to SputnikNews.com. On uh, FM in Washington, D.C., 105.5 is the magic number there. And on AM across the United States, from sea to shining sea. And uniquely, you can also watch the show. Watch or listen. And if you want to watch, it's Facebook RTUK News Facebook page. And if you are watching on Facebook, the trick is share, share, share. Share with all of your friends. And you can also watch on my YouTube channel, George Galloway Official. Last week, hundreds of thousands, I mean hundreds of thousands of people joined us for the mother of all talk shows. And some of the issues that we raised then will be returning to this evening, not just because the issues themselves are vibrant, the guests extremely important that they should be seen and heard, but because this story of the Epstein suicide, the strangest case of suicide of the 21st century so far, crosses my own life to an extraordinary degree. We'll be talking about the events in Hong Kong to a very considerable China expert because we may be reaching the end game of the months of protests in that part of China that we in Britain seem to regard still as a corner, uh, our corner of a foreign field. We'll be of course talking to the cleverest man in England Hashtag Ask Adam. Get your questions in now for Adam. Hashtag Ask Adam. We'll be talking to Ahmed Caballo, a rising star in broadcasting and journalism, who's just back from the rock of Gibraltar, where he oversaw the release of the Iranian tanker, boarded like an act of piracy by British Royal Marines some weeks ago and now ordered to be released by the Gibraltar authorities. However, a last minute attempt has been made by the United States to Shanghai the vessel all over again. We'll be talking to others in the course of the show, principally the internet sensation Whitney Webb, who when I introduced her to you last week on the mother of all talk shows, many of you had never heard of her. Everyone's heard of her now. She's ahead of the pack on the Epstein story, and she ain't going to relinquish that position. We'll be returning to talk with Whitney Webb about Epstein, Ghislaine Maxwell, and the whole scurvy crew of the erstwhile S.S. Einstein or Epstein. I call him Einstein because that's what he seemed to imagine that he was. And maybe he was more clever than other people gave him credit for. Maybe he wasn't just a scurvy billionaire with a taste for underage girls and all kinds of sexual vices. Maybe it was all a plan from the start. Maybe he'd worked out that powerful people can be led astray, can be entrapped, can be honey-trapped into doing the bidding 
of whoever his true master was. Maybe there'll be movies made about Epstein in the future as a kind of dirty James Bond working for the other side. The Maxwell story I'm determined to lay out now in front of you because Ghislaine Maxwell, the favored child of the late robber, thief, billionaire, property owner, and newspaper man, was the favorite child of Robert Maxwell for a reason. She was the favorite child because she was the child most like Robert Maxwell. British viewers and listeners of a certain age will remember Maxwell. American viewers and listeners may not yet have heard of him. So let me tell you about Robert Maxwell and my part in his downfall. I first met Robert Maxwell in the BBC studios, the green room of the then flagship BBC program, Question Time, back in 1985. The show was then hosted by the legendary Sir Robin Day, complete with polka dot bow tie. When I entered the green room, the booming voice and formidable physical presence of Robert Maxwell bore down upon me. Ah, Mr. Galway, seek, he said, the PLO man. I extended my hand to shake his, as I thought was the norm in the green rooms of the BBC, at which point he promptly punched me in the solar plexus so hard that I bent down double and tears came to my eyes. That was my first encounter with the brute. Once we took to the stage of Question Time, well, you can see that on YouTube. It's one of my first appearances on YouTube back in 1985. At that time, Robert Maxwell was an extremely powerful figure. Indeed, it's almost impossible to exaggerate just how powerful a force he was in Britain. He owned the flagship Daily Mirror newspaper and its sister Daily in Scotland, for which I would subsequently write, called the Daily Record. He owned the Sunday Mirror and its sister paper in Scotland, the Sunday Mail. He owned the People newspaper, which is still, they tell me, coming out. And he also owned, because he was a very great supporter of the European Union, a newspaper that he founded called The European. But that's not where his influence ended. He had briefly been a member of the British Parliament. He had, with a distinguished service, been an officer in the British Army, joining as a private, ending the war as a captain, in occupied Berlin, and more of that later. He was attached to the intelligence corps of the British Army, multilingual, a refugee, a Jewish refugee from Nazi-occupied Europe. He had a formidable facility with languages. He was also just about the most hyper-confident man who ever walked the streets of this country. There was nothing that he thought he couldn't do. He'd take over football clubs and promise to merge them with one, two, three, and four other football clubs. He'd bid for every newspaper that came onto the market. He cast an enormous shadow over the media and political class here in Britain. And perhaps most importantly for this story, he had a battery of lawyers, so ferocious, like piranha, fish, a whole school of them, who were ready to descend on any adversary or enemy as designated by Robert Maxwell. And indeed, in all his newspapers, he also had a formidable uh, fleet of Fleet Street scribes 
who would attack anyone that Maxwell told them to in the most lurid and ferocious terms. It came as a great consolation to me when almost all of them had their pensions stolen by Robert Maxwell. But here's where I come in again. At the time in the 1980s, I was working for the satirical magazine in London called Private Eye. Robert Maxwell may well have been our public enemy number one. We regarded him as a fat fraud, fraudulent, a forgery, his whole life a forgery, and we were not afraid to say so. In one celebrated legal action taken by Maxwell against our magazine, our founder and editor, Richard Ingrams, went to prison rather than name me as the source of the story complained of. I never forgave Maxwell for that or for many other things. Late one Saturday night, the celebrated American author Seymour Hirsch, the man who brought us the massacre of My Lai, the story behind the massacre of American war crimes in Vietnam, caused to be delivered to my London address a file of papers. It was a chapter in a book that he intended to publish, but in a very unusual move, Robert Maxwell's lawyers had forbidden to be printed, distributed, or sold a pre-publication injunction, which meant that it was impossible for this celebrated American author to have his story read here in Britain. But the papers were interesting enough to me that on the Monday I went into Parliament and concisely summarised the principal charges against Robert Maxwell from Seymour Hersh's book. They were inter alia that Maxwell was a Mossad agent, that Maxwell was the greatest thief in Britain in the 20th century and had stolen half a billion pounds of his own employees' pension funds, that Maxwell had betrayed the whereabouts in London of the brave Israeli Jewish whistleblower Mordechai Vanunu, who came to London and foolishly turned up at Robert Maxwell's newspapers with the secrets of Israel's hundreds of nuclear weapons maintained at Dimona in the Negev desert. This story was subsequently published courageously by Andrew Neil at the Sunday Times, again of which more later. But his whereabouts, now known to Maxwell, were leaked according to my motion in the British Parliament to the Mossad, who honey-trapped Vanunu with a blonde woman in Leicester Square called Cindy. And he woke up, drugged, gagged, and bound in the hold of an aircraft bound for Israel. When he got off that aircraft, his jaws were wired together like Hannibal Lecter, so that he couldn't impart any more truths to the world about Israel's illegal and secret nuclear arsenal. When my motion was published and thus the words in it were covered by parliamentary privilege, every newspaper in the world could report the allegations that I was making, and they did. The allegations continued that Maxwell's then foreign editor, a man by the name of Nicholas Davis, was a gun runner. I know it sounds fanciful, but I'm not making it up. And that he'd been selling weapons in the United States of America. My early day motion in Parliament exploded 
like a nuclear bomb in the life of Robert Maxwell. No one had dared speak to him that way before. And if they had, without the cloak of parliamentary privilege, they would have been ruined. I was nearly ruined. Maxwell told his staff at the Daily Mirror and the Daily Record to micturate all over Galloway, and they proceeded to do so. On the front page of all their newspapers, day after day, Sunday after Sunday, they called me every name under the sun. I was lower than a louse. I was a jackal scavenging in the dung heap. I was a friend of Arab terrorists. Every calumny that they could summon, they summoned. I immediately sued them for defamation. And within four weeks, Robert Maxwell was dead. Off the back of his yacht called, you guessed it, the Lady Ghislaine, called after his favorite child, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, the companion, one-time girlfriend, alleged procurer and pimp of Jeffrey Epstein. Within days of Robert Maxwell's demise, he was buried with full state honors by the Israeli government on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. The president of Israel and the prime minister of Israel and seven serving and former heads of Israeli intelligence were there at the graveside at the funeral. All the state personages talked of the enormous service that Robert Maxwell provided for the state of Israel. And then those hacks that had micturated all over me realized that the man for whom they had micturated had stolen their pensions. One of them's in the gallery tonight. One of my oldest friends, Maxwell, stole his pension too. Within days, the Daily Mirror foreign editor, Nicholas Davis, was revealed in the Daily Mirror as an arms dealer. Pictures of him selling weapons in the United States. I've had many victories in my life, quite a few defeats also. But my victory over Robert Maxwell and his crew was just about the most complete of my life. And of course, the Daily Mirror now had no defense to my libel action and had to pay me so much money that I bought some of their company. I bought some of their shares. I bought a beautiful vintage motor car. I still drive today. I bought a house one wing of which they paid for. It was an extraordinary victory. And now the Maxwells are back in my life in the form of Ghislaine. Now, I'm determined to get to the bottom of what Ghislaine Maxwell knew and when she knew it. I'm determined to find out where she is. I had intended to say in this monologue that she's been spotted and photographed by the New York Post in a burger joint in Los Angeles. But I learned from the cleverest man in England, Ask Adam, moments before I came on air, that that photograph in the New York Post appears to be itself a forgery, a Photoshop. Perhaps she was in that burger joint. Perhaps she is in LA. We're better for someone like her. Or perhaps she isn't in LA or in the burger joint. Perhaps she's somewhere else entirely. Perhaps she is being lauded for her services to whichever state employed Mr. Jeffrey Epstein. Perhaps like Robert Maxwell, She's no longer with us. Perhaps she too will fall off the end of a boat 
or be pushed off the end of a boat. Who knows? We never did find out what happened to her father. We may never find out what happened to her. But I'm here to say to the U.S. authorities, it is an outrage, an insult to the victims of Jeffrey Epstein that somewhere she is walking free. She ought to be taking his place in the dock. And if I have breath, I'm going to keep on fighting for that. It's all coming up over the next uh, two and a half or more hours on the Open University of the Airwaves, the College of Knowledge, where there are no tuition fees and where your point of view is particularly welcome, even, indeed especially, if it disagrees with mine. You can now call us on a US number too. The US number is 0017577444. Four four eight zero. Our UK number remains the same. Four four two zero seven seven nine eight two two five five. That's the two phone numbers. They should be coming up on the screen uh, below me. You can also tweet the show at George Galloway at RTUK News. And don't forget, we've got our own Twitter handle now, also at GG Motes. So that's at George Galloway at RTUK News or at GG Motes. You can also leave me a video message on Skype at GG Motes. And remember, 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 share, share, share. If you're watching on Facebook now, I beg you, share. Our audience last week was a record. Hundreds of thousands of viewers and listeners. I'm determined that one day I should be able to talk about the millions of people who are watching and listening to this show. The great Whitney Webb is up next after this. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Friday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a weekly segment of the worst mainstream media headlines of the week. They tell us what's behind the worst, most misleading, and funniest headlines from around the news with Steve Pat of the blog Left Eye on the News. Together, they pull apart the corporate media's bias, spin, and downright lies. Tune in this Friday and every Friday for the worst and most misleading headlines of the week. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. It's the mother of all talk shows, and it's a truly global show tonight. Hellos from Denmark, France, California, Glasgow, Yorkshire, Ontario and Canada, South Dakota, Helsinki, Iceland, Pennsylvania, South Africa, Nigeria, Pittsburgh, Texas, Florida, Slovenia, Ireland, the Highlands of Scotland, Birmingham, Dorset, Glastonbury, Minehead. Wow. And that's just for starters. Now... Whitney Webb is ahead of everyone on the Jeffrey Epstein story. The story runs and runs, and so does our association with Mint Press and Whitney Webb, who should be on the line now. Good evening again, Whitney. Wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Hello, it's great to be back on the program. You were an internet sensation over here, I must <laughs> tell you. Your, uh, your followers must have grown exponentially and they were already big as so they should be because Mint Press and you have done some fantastic work on this. I want to start with Ghislaine Maxwell if I can. Is mm -hmm. she or is she not in a burger joint in Los Angeles? Uh, I do not think she is there. I think that photo was likely staged. No one knows when it was taken. It was taken by an anonymous photographer and I think the biggest giveaway that this was um, 
you know, staged for propaganda purposes is the book she was allegedly reading about the life and death of CIA operatives um, after it has come out in recent months that Jeffrey Epstein was alleged to have ties to intelligence. Um, I think this was a photo op meant to taunt the public and for Ghislaine Maxwell to flaunt uh, that she feels like she is untouchable um, because she has still not been arrested. And if the US authorities had any interest in actually pursuing this case, she would have at least been brought in for questioning. She has not. Um, another indication that this, um, um, this investigation is a complete farce is the fact that um, it was not only un until I believe two days after his death, the last time I was on the show, that they decided to raid his island. But to date, his ranch in New Mexico where he was known to take these girls he enslaved has still not been raided by federal authorities. They re they announced yesterday uh, yesterday that they are thinking about it, uh, but they have still not raided it. So I would encourage everyone to, um, if they're interested, to call the FBI uh, on their hotline and let them know that people are wondering why the FBI has waited so long to raid a ranch where Epstein was known to carry, about, carry out these activities. Um, I also think it's worth pointing out, too, that prison guards are not cooperating with this investigation, and um, the mainstream media um, is, is essentially smearing anyone that contests um, or, or raises these questions, uh, saying that they're not trusting in the authorities and that they're not believing um, the results of the autopsy, among other things, when Epstein's own defense lawyers contest the results of the autopsy. So I think... Um, what is going on with the Ghislaine and Maxwell photo op and In-N-Out Burger is just um, one of the many things we saw this week um, in this, what I would really call a despicable media spectacle uh, that's meant to distract from the tr true nature of the crimes and other co-conspirators like Leslie Wexner. Um, what they're doing here with Ghislaine Maxwell saying she's in Boston, no, she's in LA, is turning her into, into some sort of, you know, Carmen Sandiego figure, basically saying here she, she's here now and she's there now. Um, you know, the U.S. government knows where she is. The NSA collects everything that go, electronic that goes on in the U.S. Uh, so if she's there, they know where she is. And the fact that they're, you know, acting like she just pops up one place and pops up another place, I just think is, um, you know, they're essentially, they, they must either think the, the American public is dumb or doesn't care. I don't know what. Um, but it just, um, the whole thing honestly makes me sick. The Scarlet Pimpernel. Well, look, first, uh, the first thing, first, Tama. Can we get the FBI hotline number? Because if we can, let's encourage all of our viewers and listeners to call the FBI and ask them why they haven't arrested this woman yet and make the point that Whitney has that the NSA has to know by definition where she is. If she's in the United States, of course, Whitney. It is possible uh, that like her father, uh, she has a bolt hole, albeit his was posthumous, uh, in Israel, isn't it? Um, I don't know if his boat was in Israel. No, Sorry, no, but um, he, his body is. Oh, yeah, he was buried there on the Mount of Olives. That's correct. It, it's possible she could be there. Uh, a lot of people have speculated that, like her father, that she had a relationship with the Mossad. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to turn back to the point you made about Wexner. You see, you're, you're, near, you're much closer to it than me, but I'm following it as closely as any man on these islands is. My theory is that Epstein was never a billionaire at all. Mm -hmm. the, the money he used was Wexner's money. And that the billionaire facade, uh, that the, the $77 million house, for example, in Manhattan, uh, there's a great deal of suspicion that this house was given to him by Wexner. That the money that he used to make him look like a billionaire was Wexner's money. And this was to create this uh, Potemkin village uh, behind the walls of which Epstein was luring his powerful friends into high crimes and misdemeanors against young girls and even children for the purposes of blackmail, political blackmail. That's my working hypothesis. What say you on that? I would um, definitely agree. I think it's very telling over the past week how little media coverage there has been uh, that has been given to Leslie Wexner. Actually, all I really saw um, was an article called uh, The Relationship Between Leslie Wexner and Jeffrey Epstein Explained that attempt to distance Leslie Wexner from Jeffrey Epstein. But if you look into the history of the relationship, it's, it's abundantly clear that Wexner um, had a lot to be afraid of. It's worth pointing out that right before Wexner 
um, met Jeffrey Epstein, there was a, an incident in Columbus, Ohio, where Wexner is based, and there was the mob-style murder of a lawyer named Arthur Shapiro, who was representing uh, Leslie Wexner's company, The Limited, and he was about, to, uh, a day before he died, about to testify um, in front of a grand jury about tax evasion and offshore uh, tax shelters, and um, a, a, an investigation into that death was highly suppressed uh, by the Columbus Police Department, but Wexner was implicated. He was also tied to the Genovese crime family, and later on in the 1980s, Wexner um, was tied to Southern Air Transport, the CIA front company involved in Iran-Contra. Um, Epstein was also known to have been in tax sh shelters, uh, money laundering, things of that nature. And right after, not long after Shapiro died, Wexner began his relationship with Epstein, where, whereby Epstein is said to have fixed Wexner's tangled finances. So I think that's quite significant there, especially considering that once that relationship began, uh, Epstein had near complete control over Wexner's finances for decades. Not only did Wexner give him for a single dollar his New York penthouse, he also gave him a plane. Um, among many other things, he made him a board on his family's foundation. Um, I think it's abundantly clear um, that um, Epstein, why he was working for Wexner, continued to be involved in these financial shenanigans. And Wexner certainly would have had a lot to lose if Epstein had cooperated with authorities, which according to Epstein's lawyers, he had planned to do before he was found dead. So I think it's highly significant that Wexner's name has been left out of the press, as is the fact that Wexner has also been accused of raping Epstein's enslaved, uh, the, the, these girls that he enslaved at least seven times, according to victim depositions. And there has been no mention of this in the press. Instead, they are saying that Wexner had no idea about what was going on. But in fact, in 1996, at Wexner's own home, uh, Epstein had hired an artist, Maria Farmer, uh, to, uh, uh, for some artwork. Uh, to, to paint something in Wexner's home, and Epstein sexually assaulted her. She called the police, and Wexner's per it was Wexner's personal security guards that would not let Miss Farmer leave for a matter of hours, even though she feared for her life. Um, so I think the fact that Leslie Wexner claims he has no idea what was going on there um, is is highly dishonest. And I think the fact that he um, it, it's quite clear as well that he has um, a lot of PR people on this situation right now trying to cover his up and keep his name out of the press. And I think it um, is very um, important that people pay attention to the facts around Wexner, because uh, I think the big names that need to be brought to justice now that Epstein is gone uh, would be his main co-conspirators, who would, of course, be Ghislaine Maxwell and then Leslie Wexner, who, by all indications, appear to have been financing this entire operation. Now, while you're on about painters, uh, why did Epstein have a painting of Bill Clinton in women's clothes and a wig on the wall of the aforementioned Manhattan uh, house? Well, I can only speculate as to why that is. Um, I think there are two possibilities. One, that it's Bill... Uh, sort of a, com a combination of Bill and Hillary together, sort of implying that they were both sort of owned by this um, same network that Epstein was related to. Um, my next report coming out next week will show that the, the Clinton family has long been tied to a lot of these same um, individuals um, going back um, to the 1980s when, when Bill Clinton was governor of Arkansas. Um, another possibility is that the blue dress is actually the infamous blue dress of Monica Lewinsky. Of course, it's known that um, one of the first people to obtain uh, evidence of uh, Lewins uh, the Monica, Le uh, Monica Lewinsky's relationship with Bill Clinton was actually Benjamin Netanyahu, who obtained phone um, recordings of their rather steamy phone conversations and attempted to use that as leverage over Bill Clinton. Um, so if it indeed is true that the Mossad was um, connected to what Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were doing that could be um, related um, to why he had that photo of uh, Bill Clinton in, in, in uh, the blue dress in his, in his house. But um, more broadly speaking, I think it's quite telling, as I said earlier, that this painting of Bill Clinton uh, in a dress has gotten much more attention than, say, Leslie Wexner, um, or has even bothered to really interview any of Epstein's victims and how they feel about um, his death, for example. So I think, you know, these sort of um, stories in one sense are, are meant to distract a little bit from the true nature of, of this crime and the fact that this is a, a much larger network than just Jeffrey Epstein um, and that it was linked to intelligence potentially in two countries um, and that his co-conspirators are still on the loose.
and making it known that they're not uh, afraid of getting, um, you know, arrested or even questioned by authorities um, by all appearances. Now, uh, finally, Whitney, uh, Iran-Contra, uh, for the, those of us done certain age, this was a very, very big thing in the 1980s. But for a lot of people watching and listening, they perhaps don't know uh, as much as they ought to about the significance of Iran-Contra. And I mention it because all of the people in this drama, all of them, have some connection to the Iran-Contra affair, don't they? Yes, many of them do, it's true. Um, and it's very troubling. This is um, an operation that, that greatly involved um, really this nexus that I, I, I point out in my reports um, between the CIA, the Mossad and organized crime, um, and other shady individuals, including uh, notorious arm dealers like Adnan Khashoggi um, and people like that. Um, Actually, it's worth pointing out that Epstein uh, perhaps did have some relation to Iran-Contra himself because during the very time Adnan Khashoggi was on the Mossad payroll and working with the CIA in Iran-Contra, uh, he had hired Epstein uh, for some sort of financial services yeah. of some sort. And yeah. Epstein, like, according uh, to... Like, I, like Adnan Khashoggi needed financial advice <laughs> from a former school teacher called Jeffrey Epstein. Right. Right, it's quite bizarre. It's also worth pointing out as well that the Evening Standard um, of, of, of England in 2001 reported that Epstein used to claim that in the 19, or early 1980s he was working for the CIA. So I think that's uh, quite significant and that leads me to believe that perhaps Epstein may have had some sort of association with um, the bank BCCI, which was well known uh, to be involved in the Iran-Contra scandal um, in money laundering and also the funding of groups like Al Qaeda. Um, because why else would um, Adnan Khashoggi want his services? Adnan Khashoggi was also known to be a major figure uh, in that bank during the time. Um, so there's a lot of this going back to Iran-Contra, but um, as I said, it, it, was, it was something that was done by um, the neoconservatives and, and their allied factions in the CIA in, con in conjunction with Israel. Um, and it was, it was highly illegal. It brought a lot of suffering to many places in the world, including Latin America, specifically Central America, um, and it, 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 uh, and this uh, network was also involved during this time uh, in sexual trafficking, the trafficking of children from Central America to the United States, allegedly to pedophile rings. And some people connected to the Iran-Contra network were also known to be uh, sexual blackmail uh, specialists for the CIA um, during this time and also uh, previously in the 1970s as well. And these activities from all indications continued well uh, into the 90s. And it is my... Um, opinion from my investigation that Epstein, uh, later on when he teamed up with Ghislaine Maxwell in, 19, in the early 1990s, uh, he himself became a part of this same network, um, but perhaps more deeply tied to the Mossad than some of the other ones that sprung up and were largely just uh, based in the United States um, mm. because Epstein's was much more international in scope. Now, uh, uh, just uh, uh, in, uh, in conclusion, uh, I saw a picture of Chelsea Clinton's wedding the other day. And in the front row pew, as a guest of honor, is Ghislaine Maxwell. Mm -hmm. Extraordinary closeness uh, to the yes. Clinton family. Whitney, uh, just tell us how people can follow your work. And do please stay safe, because we need you back on here Thank next you. week, I'm sure. Whitney, <laughs> tell, us, tell us how people follow you. Um, all of my work right now can be found at mintpressnews.com. You can also follow me um, at underscore Whitney Webb. Um, I don't often use Facebook, um, but you can follow Mint Press News on Facebook as well, as well as on Twitter. Just look for Mint Press News. Thank you very much indeed. Whitney Webb, the extraordinary tangled web that she has begun to untangle of the deceptions of the American intelligence community, and who knows who else's intelligence community and some of their key operatives. We'll be right back. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. I'm Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. Tune in! Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you're saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. 
This is Dr. Bill Honigman of Progressive Democrats of America, PDAmerica.org. Hey, everybody. My name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning and I'm looking for what's on the queue for today, I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Hundreds of messages. Don't have time for most of them, I'm very sorry to say, but I promise you I will read them all. Uh, Jeff Joffe says, oh, goody, Whitney Webb's on again. She's very, very popular, I must say. Paul Cardan says, the New York Times tells us that Epstein death conspiracy theories, quote, have been refuted. Safe conclusion here is A, they need to consult the dictionary on the meaning of refuted, or B, they're lazy. And Johnny Case says, so glad Whitney's on again. Cohen says, don't bomb Iran. The Iranians can fight back. The Iranians will fight back. This is not Iraq 2003. More on that subject later. Brian McLaren says, Epstein faced his own death and done a runner with the pension money. Neville says, you forgot to say Robert Maxwell was an ex-Labour MP. Well, <laughs> inexplicably, I did. Uh, he was a Labour MP for a couple of years, and he was a Labour benefactor, uh, which was the reason for the story in Private Eye in the first place. I'll come back to that perhaps later in the show. Music Mad says, George, do you think the UK should get involved with what is happening in Hong Kong as they want our help or let China take them over. Hey, Music Mad, you need to learn a bit more about politics. You can't take over that which you already govern, that which is already a part of your country. And herein lies a conundrum. I have been attacked this weekend in The Times, The Sunday Times and The Daily Mail for supporting China's right to govern in Hong Kong, even though that's hardly an extraordinary proposition, as Hong Kong is part of China in the same way that Yorkshire is a part of England. And nobody would say that the British state has no right to govern in Yorkshire. And this leads me to our next guest. Dr. Ranjit Bra is a consultant, surgeon, vascular surgeon, an intellectual of the highest order. He's one of Britain's leading communists. You may have seen him on my television show yesterday, Sputnik on RT. 
You might want to look that up if you haven't. He's a very considerable China expert. And he, like me, has been challenging what is now, Ranjit, a prevailing narrative. Uh, you don't get attacked in the leader column of the Times and the Sunday Times, as I was this weekend, without the state giving its nod to its media uh, to step up uh, the agitation against China. Because that's what's happening here, isn't it? Absolutely, George. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you in, as I say, one of the few corners of the media which is unafraid to tell the truth and unafraid of the bullying and pressure that comes from the mainstream mm. media mm. when you do so. I laugh at it, to be honest. Well, I laugh in their face. Well, and, and you do so very successfully, George. Thank you. You're, a, you're a real, uh, as my father would say, dar stone in their doll or a fly <laughs> in their ointment, as the English would say. <laughs> Thank you. But tea is a, is a very strong reference. Yorkshire is a very strong reference. Mm. If you look at the history of Hong Kong, and if you don't mind, I'll take it very briefly back to the history as do, we have please do. a little more time to explore it. Yeah. So I, I recently had to uh, make a number of speeches on the 100th anniversary of the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. And that was a massacre committed by the British in India. And it led me on to the history of the entire colonial rule in India, which I thought I knew and understood, but in fact I read 20, 30 books on the subject and found how interwoven uh, the history of Britain is, the history of our parliament, the history of the subversion of our own democracy with the rule of a company elite in India, Sir, the Sirkar, the company Raj. And it was that company rule, you know, who initially they took control over Bengal and then gradually took over the whole of India, and it was the jewel in the crown of British imperialism. But it was that same company who were instrumental then in the assault upon China and the wresting from China of Hong Kong. They actually found that tea, you've got a beautiful mug that you've been drinking from that says Yorkshire tea on it, and York, tea is a part of British culture as it's a part of Indian culture. The difference is they produce it and we consume and trade in it, but overwhelmingly it's been their tea. When the British went to India, there was no tea in India. Tea was from China, hence the expression, all the tea in China. The British set up a very lucrative trade in tea, but they found they were draining their treasury of gold in having to pay for it. The origins of the slave trade were in that conundrum, but equally, the origins of the opium trade. And what the British did in the fields of Bengal, in fact, as millions of Bengalis were starving, so very few people know that the British Raj the British government presided over a holocaust in Bengal in which some 30 million people died alone between 1875 and 1900. So huge numbers. 30 million, three zero. 30 million. And many talk of holocaust, few references in our school textbooks to that integral part of British history and Indian history. But what they did in order to circumvent the fact that they were losing money on the tea trade from the National Treasury of Britain, because China was an advanced country, despite the fact that it was a, a, um, a feudal country, it was an ancient civilization that wanted very little from the outside world initially. So to trade with it, you had to give it gold. Uh, and in return, um, it was draining the wealth of those who were running the trade, who controlled the Treasury of Britain. And what they did is they started actually growing opium in Bengal. And they grew opium. In, on a mass scale and exported it to China and initially traded in it and it caused huge social problems in China such that the Qing dynasty actually banned them from doing so and the British in order to perfect, protect their right to free trade you often hear the British Conservative government bemoaning the, the nanny state and the rights of the individual and the freedom of trade well this is what it actually meant and this is how Jardine Matheson, which went on to become HSBC, the bank that I have a, a, an account with, who have a huge tower not far away from us in the city yeah, of London, back there, yeah. and who have a founding influence in Hong Kong. This is how they founded their wealth and their, and their particular dynasty in the opium trade. And probably they were involved in, in addicting 17 to 18 million Chinese in opium to make a huge amount of money. And they waged a three-year war between 19... Sorry. Uh, 1839 and 1842, which ended because they had more advanced munitions, gunboats, and literally gunboat diplomacy. It's again where the, where, the, where the term comes from that we're so familiar with and remains a phenomenon within our world. It's where it comes from. So they, they arrested Hong Kong 
So they'd set up a trading port, but they, uh, Hong Kong was first in the first Nanking Treaty in 1842 to cede it indefinitely to the British. And then there were further extensions to that after the next Opium War, where they gained the, uh, the, the Kowloon Peninsula, and then further on even the, the, the um, new territories. And in fact, the new territories was the only lease that was time limited and it was that 99-year lease coming to an end which precipitated the return of Hong Kong to China but it's always been China just as Taiwan has also always been China so we took Hong Kong at the point of a gunboat to punish China for stopping our selling of opium. Heroin predates heroin, doesn't it? The kind of base of heroin. It is essentially the same drug. So, I mean, we give it today, it's got medicinal uses, but it was not medicinal use that it was used for. It was drug addiction, and it had a hugely negative effect on Chinese society, even Chinese feudal society, to the extent, the extent that the Chinese said no more. They banned it, and Britain went, went to war to force yeah. opium upon the Chinese people. So we pounded them until they gave us Hong Kong as punishment for this uh, restriction on free trade <laughs> that they were Precisely. responsible for. So it goes back to China in 1997. But it's quite clear, isn't it, that in their hearts at least, the British have never actually left it. They still think they have a right to dictate what happens there. Every British publication and broadcasting company in the in the country has got people there on the ground in Hong Kong whilst 29 miles away in France where the yellow vests have been being bludgeoned beaten people getting their eyes blown out their hands blown off for 40 weeks and there's not a British correspondent there that's all indicative isn't it that the British feel they still have some rights in Hong Kong George, I think you're absolutely right. You've commented many times before, and it won't be new to your listeners, the concept that the mainstream media is not an impartial force. Uh, even if you go, imperial war is not new, campaigns of destabilization are new, conflict is not new, it's an integral part of human history. But what is perhaps a modern phenomenon, and I noticed particularly at the time of the Iraq war, uh, but you've seen since then as well, uh, is that now the mainstream media has become a part of the war process machine. of waging yeah. war itself yeah. and you know deeply it, embedded deeply embedded to the extent that really it's you can you can call it a campaign of psychological war which is why you know don't refer back to goebbels but this concept that the big lie you tell it often enough and people will start to believe it and equally if you challenge that lie and you challenge that narrative and you challenge really the vested interests of the very rich and powerful they actually will start to attack and undermine you, and you'll be very familiar with that, as you were talking about in your first story, mm. George. Mm. But yes, it, you know, in terms of showing their colours and showing their hand, the Hong Kong protesters themselves have very clearly shown their masters in the flags that they've displayed. They're ripping down the Chinese flag, though they are Chinese, ethnically, and in terms of their nationality. Despite the fact that there's one country, two systems, they're Chinese people. And uh, they're ripping down that flag and they're openly displaying the flag of their masters who are very directly paying the leaders of that movement. The United States flag has been to the fore. The British flag was early hoisted inside the trashed, wrecked uh, parliament building uh, of the local uh, parliament in Hong Kong. Uh, NGOs, uh, which I refer to as Trojan horses, uh, are being activated. Some of them have been munching on Western hay for a long time. Now is the time for them to earn their corn. And they're out there, uh, both on social media and on the streets. But every Hong Kong person I have seen interviewed, other than the protesters, and this even on the mainstream media, has denounced these protests because they are utterly disrupting uh, the normal way of life in Hong Kong and the normal way of life in Hong Kong is making money Indeed. and they can't make money whilst the airport's closed and uh, no, no one knows which street is going to be passable uh, from one day to the next. Absolutely. So it's clear that opinion is divided. I mean, it's reported today on the mainstream media, on the BBC as I was coming here, that 1.7 million people 
we're out demonstrating today. Now, we can argue about the numbers. It's hard to ascertain the true numbers. I've been on many demonstrations in this country, as you mm. have, George, mm. and the numbers game is itself inherently political. So yeah. those who wish to support a cause overestimate the numbers, those who wish to detract it underestimate the numbers. So perhaps it's a vast overestimation, but clearly a lot of people, it's are, a lot of people yeah. are involved in the protest and there are all kinds of different reasons for their involvement. The reasons that we're flagged up for, I think, are, 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 are spurious reasons. We're told that it's a fundamentally pro-democracy movement, as we were told that Tiananmen Square was a fundamentally pro-democracy movement. And the fact is that there's been no interference outside of the normal channels of the democratic running of the country, which is a capitalist system. As you say, it's a normal money-making major global financial center, still dominated by HSBC, still dominated by uh, Star Standard Chartered Bank and other financial institutions. Um, and so one wonders exactly what the long-term game of the protesters is. There's no question that's part of a broader campaign of destabilization, not just against Hong Kong, but against all of China. And I think there is a long-term game. People are, you know, our ruling class is prepared to put up with short-term chaos to achieve its long-term interest. And its long-term interest everywhere is not democracy, which has become, you know, absolutely hackneyed euphemism in their, in their mouths. Their long-term game is domination, and they wish to continue to dominate that financial city. They wish to continue to have their foothold in Taiwan, as many other parts of the Middle East. The US obviously has over a, a thousand military bases worldwide and expects now to have global domination. So its long-term strategy has been itself announced many times over the past decade, really, by Obama in his pivot to Asia, by Trump in his new announcement of trade wars with China, as you see in the spat with Huawei that we've witnessed across the media as well, as you've seen even with the Changi four moon landings. You know, that, that all of, in all of these dealings, you can see that the United States is extremely afraid of the rise of China and wishes to, to destabilize yeah, it, in order, it yeah. in order to gain... Just uh, gain on, on passant, yeah. there, there was no democracy in Hong Kong during the whole 150 years that we ruled it. It's not that China has taken away uh, elective governments and so on. The British had no democracy in Hong Kong, am I right? Absolutely right. It was a, it was a colonial and apartheid state in which... If you had white skin, you had certain rights, and if you had Chinese skin, you had other rights. If you have rich, you have, if you were rich Chinese, you may have more rights, but if you were poor Chinese working class, you had virtually no rights. And in fact, there were several occasions in which there were virtual revolutions and riots against the British rule and British control, and as we mentioned in... in yeah, in I'm interested in that, the rubber bullet. Yeah, absolutely. So the rubber bullet is, is a... Was, was invented by the British against the Chinese in Hong Kong. That's right. And it's a means of so-called crowd control, which is not meant to be as dangerous as live fire. It's not as dangerous as live fire ammunition, but it still can kill people. And I grew up hearing about the deaths partly because I was sympathetic towards the Republican cause, but partly because it was unavoidable. It was all over our news, caused by rubber bullets from so-called crowd control. Uh, instances of British soldiers firing rubber bullets into the face of children, literally in the streets uh, of, of, of Belfast and other places. But in fact, those rubber bullets, that technology for crowd control, comes from the British in Hong Kong, where they regularly faced a riotous situation because of the oppression of the Hong Kong people, bred a natural resistance and rebelliousness to their rule. Will this run and run? I mean, do you expect this to come to an early conclusion? Is China going to play the long game or, or bring things to a head, in your view? So this particular Hong Kong dispute is a part of the larger picture. It's clear that, you know, the US and its satellite imperialist powers are driving increasingly towards confrontation with China, confrontation with Russia. They do that strategically through other conflicts throughout the world. But I think China is a very tough nut to crack. The Chinese people are about to celebrate the 70th anniversary of their liberation in 1949 when Chairman Mao said famously the Chinese people have stood up. That ended a 150-year period of colonial humiliation and the history of Hong Kong is very bound up with that. The question is, do Chinese people have the right to reaffirm their sovereignty over Hong Kong? Well, if that's the question, very much they do. Tactically, is it wise for them to, if you like, respond to the provocation by escalating and using the military, 
That depends exactly how it plays out, George. Mm. I hope for their sake that they don't and that it's not necessary. Much better to let the protests fizzle out. They don't have widespread support. And you can see just how mainstream, certainly in the rest of China, but even within Hong Kong, is sympathy for the police and the fact that China's sovereignty is paramount. Mm. If you see that uh, the actor, for example, who plays uh, Mulan in Disney's remake, herself is sympathetic to the Hong Kong police. Charlie uh, Chan came out for, uh, for China. Uh, just uh, the other day. Indeed. I could talk to you all night, but alas, the hour. Uh, in, fa in fact, can you stay on just for a few minutes after the news? Be delighted to. Because there are one or two other issues I'd like to tease out with you. Be I'd delighted appreciate to. Thank that. you very much. George. Here's the numbers. 0044-2077-982-255. Or the US number. 001-757-744. 8 zero. Alas, it's the witching hour. You've got to listen to Tama tell you the news. I'll be right back. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Hi, this is Max Kaiser. I'm here with Stacey Herbert and we're doubling down. Yeah, we're doubling down on crazy. We're doubling down on our new show called Double Down on Sputnik. It's doubling down on absolute joyous radio nirvana. You will love it. You will want to listen to every single episode on Sputnik. Bye, y'all. <laughs> radio Sputnik. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation, with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country, what's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us. Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Radio Sputnik News. This week, the Iranian oil tanker Grace One was given permission to leave Gibraltar after spending a month in detention following its seizure by UK Marines. Commenting on the decision, Iranian Navy commander Admiral Hussein Khadandi said Iran was ready, if necessary, to send warships to escort the Iranian tanker. On Friday, the US Justice Department issued a warrant for the seizure of the Iranian supertanker. According to the document, the vessel, all the oil aboard, and 995,000 US dollars were subject to forfeiture based on violations of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act. Bank fraud, money laundering and terrorism forfeiture states. Gibraltar's authorities later confirmed that Washington had made a last-ditch request to seize the tanker on a number of allegations. On the 15th of August, Israel banned Rashida Talib and Ilhan Omar, two U.S. congresswomen, from visiting the West Bank and Jerusalem over their professed support for boycotting Israel. Tlaib failed a request to be allowed to visit her grandmother. Filed, sorry, Tlaib filed a request to be allowed to visit her grandmother on humanitarian grounds and subsequently received permission, yet demonstratively rejected the offer to go. Israeli politician Nir Barakat said on Friday that Tlaib had proven her real intention for visiting Israel, according to the Jerusalem Post. Barakat tweeted to Tlaib that she that she she intended to use her 90-year-old grandmother to wage political war calling for Israel's destruction and boycott. Barakat also wrote Rashid Tlaib and Republican uh, and Representative Ilhan Amar on Twitter on Thursday that their views do not belong in Israel. And finally, the White House economic advisor Larry Kudlow has fueled this week's social media craze around President Donald Trump's desire to acquire Greenland by saying he would not mind adding the Danish Autonomous Territory to the United States. Greenland, a key team Danish territory that is rich in mineral resources and hydrocarbons, shot to Twitter on Thursday after the Wall Street Journal reported, citing sources at the White House, that Trump had inquired about the possibility of perching the island. While some advisers have reportedly supported Trump's ideas, economically attractive, others have voiced the belief that this is just a fleeting fascination of the president and is unlikely to materialize. The report comes just weeks ahead of Donald Trump's first trip to Denmark, scheduled for early September, which is said to be unrelated to the idea. I'm Tamar Osvani. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. 
Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. You're listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. You're watching the mother of all talk shows. I'm with my guest, Dr. Ranjit Brar, consultant surgeon, one of Britain's leading communists and China expert. Uh, we're talking about the events in Hong Kong. We're talking about the sordid life and the mysterious death of Jeffrey Epstein, the whereabouts of Ghislaine Maxwell, the daughter of the disgraced tycoon Robert Maxwell. We'll be talking about Gibraltar and the Iranian tanker there. And of course, as always in the last hour, it's Ask Adam Territory. So get your questions in now, hashtag Ask Adam. Now, let me read some of the incoming Nodi Salsi says Yorkshire suspects do not need to be extradited to London in order to face trial for crimes they have committed in Yorkshire. That issue is the central cause and reason for the Hong Kong protests. If you really believe that, Nodi, I've got a bridge here in London. I'm ready to sell you at a knockdown price. And Kevin Dewey says the US revolted against the King of England and elected our own oligarchs. Marshall Villager says, do the Hong Kong protesters have any legitimate demands? We'll continue that with Dr. Bra just after this. Invictus says, I support the Hong Kong people and Chinese working class against the brutal Chinese authoritarian state. George is wrong on this one. And Walshamite says, India kicked the British out. Can Hong Kong kick Beijing out? My goodness, what kind of a comparison is that? Hong Kong people are Chinese people. English people are not Indian people. England sailed across the whole world to conquer India. Dr. Brown was telling you about Bengal. When we arrived in Bengal, it was the richest place in the whole world. And when we left it, it was the poorest place in the whole world. You don't have to be Einstein to work out what happened uh, in between. Uh, the same Walshamite says, totalitarian communism is bad news for any people. No doubt it is. Uh, Lucha Libertaria, if Hong Kong protesters represent the working class interests, why do they carry British and American flags? Uh, Dr. Ranjit, let's deal with a couple of the points that were mm. made there. Some of them are foolish, the, the Yorkshire uh, uh, comparison, uh, because of course the extradition treaty that was the proximate cause of the first demonstrations has already been iced, will not be implemented, and in any case uh, related to uh, the right of the people in Taiwan to extradite a sex offender and murderer who had taken refuge in Hong Kong, who could not be extradited either uh, to the Chinese mainland or to Taiwan. And so there is a, a, a rapist and murderer at large in Hong Kong who couldn't be sent to face justice. In any case, this... Uh, extradition treaty is now uh, way down the list of demands, way down the batting order of the protesters' demands, uh, isn't it? And do they have any legitimate demands? Thanks, George. Yeah, I, th I think it's probably worth um, touching upon the extradition treaty because it was allegedly the main concern. So the main concern, we're told, is that Hong Kong has this vibrant history of democracy which it doesn't, but we've discussed that already, and that people would suddenly be at threat of being taken from this vibrant democracy, Hong Kong, to this totalitarian dictatorship, China, where they would be subject to the will of the courts, which are beyond any kind of uh, reason uh, and, uh, and would obviously victimise them. This is, this is the narrative. The reality is, of course, Hong Kong is part of China, that they've, uh, for 50 years, they've absolutely agreed to maintain a system where they're one country, 
but they have two systems. So the capitalist system, the banking system of Hong Kong, will go unthreatened, unchallenged, and nothing has been done by China to violate that in any way. As you quite rightly say, there was a case, and I've been to uh, Hong Kong, my wife is from Hong Kong, my, my children uh, are learning Cantonese in Greenwich, and if you go from Greenwich to the Kati Sark, you can actually see a lot of this history, actually about Hong Kong and India, written there. So, I mean, this is not alien to the, to the people of Britain. We, we know it very well. But in terms of that extradition treaty, you're quite right, there was a, a young man who took his young pregnant girlfriend to Taiwan. They had an argument there. He ended up strangling, strangling her to death, along with her unborn child. Put them inside. He then, you would imagine, would shop himself, but he didn't. He didn't turn himself in. He didn't feel apparently the shame that you or I might feel if we'd committed such an act and, and reckon and deal with it. He stuffed her into a suitcase, George. He stuffed her into a suitcase, took her onto the metro and dumped her in Taiwan. He then promptly returned to Hong Kong. Now, because of the unusual colonial law of Hong Kong, they couldn't try him for any crime that's not been committed on Hong Kong. And it was the Taiwanese government who wanted to extradite him to face justice for his very heinous crime. And it was in that, that context that Carrie Lam, uh, uh, who's the, 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 the chief executive, chief executive in Hong Kong uh, was promoting this motion in order to, to set up an extradition treaty so that actually people who commit crimes in Hong Kong can be extradited elsewhere in the world. And among the countries would be mainland mm. China, mm. of which, you know, ironically, because it's one country, two systems, people can't currently be extradited. But if you think about it, with the current business climate, there are criminal elements who seek refuge from Beijing uh, uh, and, and from China by trying to go flee to Hong Kong. So it's perfectly reasonable that people face a, a judgment for their crimes. Sure it is. Let's talk to a caller in Hong Kong. Is it Chris? Chris yes, in Chris Hong Kong. Rogers, George. How are you, mate? Chris, very nice yeah. to hear from you. I was expecting a different kind of voice from Hong Kong, but it's very nice to hear the valley's lilt. Go ahead. It is, sir, and uh, you, you do know me. We, we do correspond, yes, etc. Yes, we do. I have been on the show, pre on the show previously. Yeah. Um, however, the protests that have been going on this evening, or I should say uh, yesterday, yesterday um, it, rather strange. We had notifications from our telephone providers, that's mobile, uh, warning us of the protests. And secondly, the numbers seem to have been somewhat greatly exaggerated. The figures that uh, I, I've seen myself from locals, etc., uh, uh, in Victoria Park this evening, which is about a mile away from Ledgeco, which was the offices that got the, the parliamentary building that got smashed up, uh, there were approximately about 100,000 people. Um, I, I would put that in, uh, contrast that with demonstrations against Tong Chi Wa, the first chief, chief executive um, of uh, Hong Kong, uh, approximately 2000, 2001, whereby a, a, a one in six of the population took to the road. And that, that was on economics. That was due to what's going on on the economic side. Uh, at, at the moment, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Hong Kong's <laughs> very unequal. I can tell you a great deal about that. And a lot of poor people uh, are certainly not supporting what I would call rather wealthy protesters. Uh, indeed, it, it's, I think the Chinese are holding back. The um, university term begins uh, the first or second week of September, and they'll all be off the streets again. So uh, it certainly isn't working class support that's happening at the moment. Well, let me, um, let me they, stop they you there. Not. Let me stop you there, Chris. I'll bring you back in again. I just want to put the points that you've made uh, to Ranjit. It is true, isn't it, that uh, a certain kind of demonstration gets positive coverage in the Western media, uh, the, cover, the, the marches against Brexit, for example, uh, which are also greatly exaggerated in number, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, nonetheless co are constituted of a very large numbers of people. And it's quite clear that these protests are very large protests. They are being exaggerated, uh, but they are very large protests. They also, just like the anti-Brexit protests, are largely 
composed of uh, people of a certain type. They are not working class demonstrations, as Chris in Hong Kong said. They are demonstrations of the children of the privileged, by and large. Is that a fair characterization? That's absolutely fair, George. Um, talking of the way in which demonstrations are represented, I think a brilliant example is if you look at the destabilization efforts either in Libya or in Syria, uh, when those conflicts were getting a huge amount of Western attention, millions of the citizens of Libya turned up to demonstrate in favor of the Gaddafi government. Millions of citizens of Syria turned up to demonstrate in favor of uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad's government. And we were never given full coverage of those. By contrast, I'm sure the figures will be exaggerated, which is not to say that there are not really large numbers there. Hong Kong is an incredibly wealthy city, incredibly wealthy, so wealthy that taxes are negative, if you can comprehend what that means. If you go there and have a Hong Kong identity card, they, get, they generate so much money just from a very small financial transaction tax, such as the volume of trade and money that goes through Hong Kong, that the citizens who live there, who have citizenship there, I'm not talking about the maids, and we'll come to that in a second, but the people who really have citizenship there, get paid just for having the identity card. So it's, it's a negative tax. That's how wealthy it is. To live in an apartment there, you've got a nice picture here behind you of the city of London, and we can talk about apartments here, what it means to be a world centre where capital is invested. When there's a world economic crisis, capital is invested and flats become a commodity. So they actually trade at prices mean that working class Londoners can't live in London. Hong Kong, a flat, a small two, three bedroom flat in Hong Kong costs about three million pounds, four million pounds. Wow. It's incredibly expensive. So if there's discontent amongst the workers over the cost of living, that comes from its very capitalist economic mode, which is characteristic of Hong Kong, not from Beijing's allegedly repressive role uh, in, in suppressing the population. Absolutely not. And those, as you say, those protesters who are on the streets are from those families. They're from the families who would have grown up with servants. And those servants are Filipino servants, Indonesian servants, who are there in huge numbers and treated very poorly very poorly. And I don't see our media championing the rights of the maid servants or the dock workers or the metro workers or the people who actually make Hong Kong run and tick. This is very much a protest of the relatively wealthy who seek to protect their way of life. So of course there are classes who have a vested interest in being relatively wealthy. They don't want to give up that wealth. And that's always the case. But do they represent the downtrodden and oppressed? No, they don't. Are they sponsored and responsible to the foreign governments and foreign powers? Mm. Yes, they very much are. And Mike Pence, Mike Pompeo, you know, these uh, famously hawkish vice president and secretary of state of the United States have very directly met with the so-called leaders of these protests who are in themselves political non-entities. Their power comes from directly from the sponsorship. And, you know, figures of the United States establishment have openly admitted that the National Endowment for Democracy, the mm. NED, mm. which is a 20, 30-year-old organization, which it is not a non-governmental organization. It's a United States government organization. And its role is not just to support democracy. Democracy is, is a profanity coming from their words. They don't care about the rule of the people. They care about the domination of US imperialism. And they want to destabilize states which are strategic competitors in order to ensure you know, US's financial and political domination of the world market. And Hong Kong's a very important part of that. Mm. Chris, last word to you, my friend. OK, well, all, all I can say is um, if the UK is so committed to uh, Hong Kong, it's awfully strange that the, um, the council building uh, that they had here uh, has been de-staffed, basically, since the Tories took power in 2010. Um, it was the largest consulate globally. Uh, the British Council was uh, next door to it, rather large building. Uh, however, austerity uh, was imposed here, and now they're acting on about the basic law being upheld, etc. Pure hypocrisy from the Tories. They should keep their bloody nose out of it. Thank you, it's Chris. A domestic issue. Thank you, Chris. Keep their bloody nose out of it. Uh, that's. Uh a point of view that will be uh, widely shared, but also uh, deeply contested. Last question to you, Doctor. Uh, it's my case that this is but another part of a full-spectrum attack on 
China. Uh, the uh, subject changes, but the purpose remains the same. For a time, it was the Dalai Lama and the Hollywood infatuation with a man who believes he's the uh, God, effectively. <laughs> Uh, a demigod in any case. And then uh, for a time it was the Falun Gong, an obscure uh, quasi-religious sect, cult, uh, that operates uh, underground in China. It's uh, uh, one minute, it's the uh, situation for Muslims in Xinjiang and other uh, Muslim minority areas. Uh, and now it's Hong Kong. Uh, but the purpose is to disrupt the advance of China. China's getting tired of it, and I read this weekend that China may be about to sell its US Treasury bills and thus literally devastate the US economy to offload uh, $1.3 trillion worth uh, of uh, bills that they hold uh, from the US Treasury, put them into euros or buy oil with them or whatever they uh, decide to do. Do you get the impression that China's losing patience with the provocation uh, of the United States in particular, but its loyal auxiliary uh, Britain also? I think that's a very profound observation, George. Um, China's economy is kind of a dual economy, but it's overwhelmingly marketized now and it's become integral to the capitalist economy. And as you rightly say, the US has been in huge national debt for decades, to the tune of trillions, and it's largely China buying the securities of the US that allows it to carry on, just printing dollars and carrying on, regardless of its weak economic position. Russia has for some time taken the position of dumping those bonds, and we saw recently that actually the short-term yield is now uh, a, a lower interest rate than the long-term yield on US Secretary Treasuries, meaning that there's very low confidence in the US economy and they're looking actually at the possibility of the US going through another recession. For working people, I don't think we've ever come out of this period of recession. Working people's lives have known austerity and got it, are getting poorer and poorer. But for companies, they return to profitability. But they, too, are about to lose that. China's been in the position where it's had the ability to divest for some time. But of course, it's a double-edged sword for China. If the world economy crashes and they've built their economy upon export, even though they're actually financing the export, they're financing the US's ability to buy back the goods they're producing, whilst they have such strong marketization of their economy, it risks undermining them. So they are, they are cautious of doing so. But you know, there's a debate going on within China. While the world's capitalist crisis is raging, and even China's growth is going down compared to the growth that they've always Down to 5% now, yeah. Then there is very real possibility of that divestment, and they're looking once again at the possibility of driving their own economic development through actually supplying a higher standard of living to the Chinese people. I'm an advocate of it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy road to travel for China, but it's a very real possibility, George. Dr. Ranjit Bra, thanks very much for joining us. A totally fascinating discussion on Hong Kong and the broader China question. We'll be right back. We are above all the latest developments, and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. On Sputnik with Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert, tune in! Well, maybe mention, maybe mention like central bankers and, and you know markets are doubling down. Not you're saying everybody's doubling down. They're crazy. They are. Everyone's crazy. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat from America, PD, America Todd, org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. 
the wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. Paul Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Tune in every Monday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for our regular segment, Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers, where we take a look at the state of education across the country. What's happening in our schools, colleges, and universities, and what impact does it have on the world around us? Our resident expert is Bill Ayers, the legendary activist, educator, and author. Tune in to Loud and Clear this Monday and every Monday for Education for Liberation with Bill Ayers. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. You're watching the mother of all talk shows. Coming up is another of my wonderful guests tonight, Ahmed Caballo, an up-and-coming uh, broadcaster and writer uh, who's really uh, shaking uh, the uh, corridors of power with some of his reportage from Venezuela and most latterly, Gibraltar will be coming back to that in a minute. Let me read some of the paperwork that's coming my way. Copa Maros says the strategy of the U.S. in China now is to rip apart as many pieces of China away. Hong Kong, Xinjiang, Tibet and Taiwan. Ian Brown says attack by the Times, Sunday Times and Daily Mail is a badge of honor. Indeed, Ian, I treat it that way. Nodi Salsi says protesters are demonstrating on a single issue, extradition for trial. This point is clouded out in all the generalized reporting about it as democracy. Men in black says this is a Chinese internal problem. Let them sort it out. And Bob Justice says BBC figures for the Hong Kong protest will be from the same place that estimated Six billion on an anti-EU march. Anyhow, congratulations on being attacked in the press, George. Means you've had a quiet week if they don't. And Duruti 1936 says the BBC tells one-sided narratives on Venezuela, Syria, Russia and Iran. On that subject, let me now turn to Ahmed Caballo. Uh, recently returned, I think, Ahmed from uh, the rock of Gibraltar, where you went to see uh, the freeing of the Iranian oil tanker. Just to recap, uh, this Iranian oil tanker was sailing in Spanish territorial waters, according to Spain at least, was seized on the orders of the Gibraltar government, which must mean on the orders of the Foreign Office in London, and it has been speculated at least, I don't know if it's yet been accepted or admitted, uh, that the British Foreign Office ordered the seizure of the tanker on orders or a request from Washington, from John Bolton. It's been held all this time. The crew were under arrest on board the vessel. It was not allowed to leave. Then you got word that it was about to leave. You went there. What happened next? So we went there and then all the local media, the Gibraltarian media, was saying it was going to be released on Tuesday evening. We was preparing ourselves for it to be released on Tuesday evening. That never happened. And then we assumed, OK, maybe they're waiting for the court date, which was scheduled on Thursday. So we showed up to court. Um, it was scheduled at 10.30 a.m. Um, we went inside. We listened to what the Attorney General said. And we were surprised to hear there'd been this special request 
from the United States Department of Justice put in at 1.36 a.m. on the morning of the court. So the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General looked kind of taken back by this request. He then said, let's reconvene for 4 p.m., where he can have time to assess these allegations made by the U.S. They reconvened at 4 p.m. All the journalists outside kind of started to speculate that this, this boat would be held upon the U.S. request, that the U.S. always gets its way, etc. And then at f around 4.30, to our surprise, they came out and they said, um, it's been ordered to be released with immediate effect. And I kind of I'd, I had to rewrite my notes. I was, I was preparing for the U.S. to, 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 get, its way. to get its way. So, um, so at 4.30, it was found out that the boat was um, bound to be released. Obviously, there's problems with the boat. That's the reason why it came into those waters in the first place. It, it went to um, those waters because it wanted to dock to fix some problems with the boat. That, that, that still needs to be fixed before the boat can, can, can sail off and, and go on to its final destination. But yeah, it was a very important day for what I think is British and Iranian relations because I feel like if Britain would have detained the boat or handed it over to US authorities, it would have had a really damaging effect, not just on Britain-Iranian relations, but for the whole regions, particularly in relations to this international coalition and particularly in relations to this British oil tanker, which is currently in Iranian possession. Now, uh, what were the American allegations, as you put it, and why did a court in Gibraltar or the Attorney General in Gibraltar reject the American allegations, in your view? So, I didn't know at the time on Thursday, but as the days have, have passed, we find out more. So, they claim that the, the Grace One was violating um, statutes in regards to terrorism because, obviously, the U.S. Department of Justice has designated the, Islamic Revol the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. They allege that some of the money from the boat was going into U.S. banks and U.S. Um, financial markets, which is a violation of U.S. sanctions. But to me, this kind of felt like trumped-up charges, excuse the pun. Um, because they wanted to hold on to the boat and they kind of made this public declaration that they, they, they issued this warrant and US officials were already talking as if the boat was already in their possession. Mm. So now it's kind of they're trying to make, make up for, for what was a very embarrassing defeat on the international stage. Yeah, uh, it is extraordinary. Uh, it may uh, mean something or it may mean nothing. It may be an aberration by a local official, but I doubt it. It sounds to me as if it was a signal from uh, London uh, that they do not want to escalate the conflict with Iran, and that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? It would, and sorry, I, I didn't answer your previous question. The Chief Minister, the Attorney General and the Gibraltar Supreme Court had assessed these new allegations and decided that the initial reason why they detained the boat was based on what they believed to be a violation of EU sanctions because the boat was what they believed, although the Iranians denied this, on its way to Syria. Now, nothing that the Americans alleged contradicted the reason for the initial seizure. So, therefore, the reason why they detained the boat was no longer valid and, therefore, it was free to go. So, um, and in regards to Britain-American relations, it is very substantial because we heard about this international coalition, which to me, to quote the Iranian Foreign Minister, Mr. Zarif, would create a tinderbox in the Middle East. Britain, America and Israel leading an international coalition in the Middle East, particularly with Iranian-Israeli um, um, relations and with the U.S.'s history in the Middle East. Let's not forget, in 1988, it was a U.S. boat in the Persian Gulf that shut down an Iranian passenger plane, and the Iranians have not forgot that. So they would have saw this as a direct, aggressive act against them. And, as you know, the Iranians probably would have retaliated in some way. Yeah, uh, I mean, the Iranians deny that the so-called British boat, as a matter of fact, it could hardly be less British. <laughs> Swedish. Uh, it was made in China. It's owned uh, by Sweden. Its crew are entirely non-British. Uh, for some reason, it was flagged in Scotland, uh, and only then because it was flagged by a company which is a subsidiary of a Swedish company and so on. So it was a cause celebre made out of very little. But the Iranians obviously took it, uh, although they deny it, uh, to, uh, to make their point that if you're going to steal our tankers, we're going to steal yours. 
Of course, now you've got to imagine, this is the Islamic Republic was built on people power. They've got to take a hard stance. When there is aggressive policies by Western imperial powers, they've got to show that they're, going to, they're willing to stand up for their people. They want to see that when the big bad wolf blows, they blow back. So there would be some sort of retaliation. I have saw your post previously on RT where you said if Iran was to, were to be attacked, they'd be setting on fires throughout the Middle East because the public wants that. They're suffering under a sanctions regime. The very least they can expect from their government is some sort of fight back and some sort of resistance against um, US empire. Let me, I don't know if you're uh, qualified to answer these questions. I'm not actually really qualified to ask them, but they occur to me. Uh, my reading is there are no sanctions on the delivery of crude oil uh, by anyone to Syria and that therefore the initial seizure was itself unlawful. Secondly, Iran is not in the European Union. It has no sanctions on Iran, quite the opposite. And so the only thing, uh, the only interface uh, between this Iranian oil tanker and the European Union is that Iran's tanker was sailing past the European Union. Yeah. Uh, no other European country in the entire conflict in Syria has boarded a vessel, uh, an oil tanker, bound for Syria. Um, so here we have this paradox of the British, whether under orders from, Moscow, uh, from uh, Washington or not, uh, boarding a tanker that they only scarcely, if at all, had the right to board, and then the British setting it free despite American objections. It's all very peculiar. It is, it is, and there's various reasons for that. So obviously that was done under a previous administration of Theresa May, and the Foreign Secretary at the time was Jeremy Hunt, two out-and-out -out Remainers. Now we've got Brexiteers very much at the helm in Dominic Raab and, um, and Boris Johnson. So the idea that a Brexiteer Prime Minister would be trying to enforce European Union sanctions more hard than, than the European any other <laughs> members of the European Union. Is, so when Mr. Zarif said they're trying to be more Catholic than the Pope, yeah. they're trying to be more European than the European, yeah. the, than the yeah. European Union. So it is ridiculous. But I, I, I must say, I did think with Boris Johnson, with the fact that John Bolton was in Britain at the time, I was very, very surprised at this kind of turn of events. And I'm not usually often surprised yeah. by anything that happens in international politics. So it'd be interesting to know what was going on in those conversations between yeah, Gibraltar on the wall. and London. Is there any chance, Ahmed, that this could still go wrong? Uh, the boat is still in Gibraltar. Uh, you remember what happened to the Rainbow Warrior, though it'd be a pretty big fire if they blow up uh, the Grace One. Uh, the Rainbow Warrior was a, a Greenpeace ship that was blown up by France in New Zealand, wow. caused a, a, a huge international crisis, uh, changed governments actually. Uh, is there any possibility that the US will even now seek to uh, intercede to, to board, to halt the return of this tanker to Iran? Presumably it is going back to Iran, is it? I don't know where the boat is destined to. Iranians denied it was ever going to Syria in the first place. So it might, if you're taking the Iranian point of view, you might be going to the initial destination, wherever that was, wherever that may be. Well, somewhere in the Mediterranean. So, somewhere in the Mediterranean. Seems unlikely. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I obviously can't comment on that. Um, but I would, if the US was willing to leave this, you'd think they'd want it to be out of the news. You'd think the US... Trump administration would stop making comments, but they keep making comments which suggest there is potential for another action. Because if I was Donald Trump's administration and I'd be kind of given a bloody nose like this, I'd, I'd try to hide my face and pretend like it never happened, but they're not doing that. So it does worry me a little bit that there might be somewhat of a plan B. Well, we'll have you in uh, should that happen, uh, though that would in fact be an even more provocative act than, uh, than the first one. Uh, to have the court free the vessel and then the US unilaterally to seize the vessel. Uh, 
perhaps the Iranian Navy, perhaps some other Navy uh, is necessary to escort the, the vessel back. It's got two million barrels of oil on it. Yeah. Uh, as I say, that would make one hell of a fire. Yeah. Uh, or if it was sunk or scuttled even, would make a hell of a mess yeah. in, the, uh, in the environment, in the, in the water. It's, uh, it's a fascinating story. Ahmed Caballo, thanks very much for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Let's take a quick break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. By any means necessary is your guide to the movement and efforts shaping the world around us. From mass incarceration. No longer am I interested in or concerned with prison reform. I am interested only in the eradication of prisons. To the battle between police and water protectors. It was a pretty punishing disregard for the sanctity of human life that unleashing water cannons on peaceful, prayerful water protectors. From efforts to protect the environment. The climate movement is ready to, with plenty of opposition research and force and strength, along with, you know, the right of both science and morality to fight them on this. To the movement for black lives. When I first saw the Michael Brown video, when I saw that it clearly contradicted the narrative put forth uh, by the Ferguson Police Department and by police supporters in general, three words came to mind. Color me shocked. Stay tuned to By Any Means Necessary, five days a week here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. Don't forget, you can call. You can call the uh, British number. You can call the U.S. number. You can tweet. You can tweet me. You can tweet RTUK News. You can tweet GG Motes. And follow GG Motes, please, if you haven't already. And if you're watching on Facebook, please share, share, share with all of your friends. Uh, we've got so many messages. I'm trying to get to make a dent in them. Carl Defoe says, can anybody disappear while still alive in today's surveillance society? I fear not actually, Carl. Joe XP says, wow, I had no idea of your extensive history with Robert Maxwell, George. Joyous to hear you bested him the way you did. There is hope. Yep, it was one of my best ever victories, Joe. Joe Bloggs says, prison guards, this is at the MCC in Manhattan, are 100% complicit. Yeah, look, at the very least, this was assisted suicide. This was suicide assisted by the guards. Now, whether the guards gave that assistance because Epstein bribed them to, asked them to, or because someone else did is, of course, another matter. SFL says, I have an idea for a new edition of Cluedo. It was Bill Clinton in a blue dress and heels with a candlestick on the Lolita Express. And Helen says, why haven't the FBI raided the ranch? True News have. You should get them on. Yeah, make a note of that, please. True News, please, Tama. Uh, Mary Fadul says, so many cover-ups, so many lies. And Gail Wells says, Epstein's collusion with Hoffenberg on the greatest scam in the U.S., similar to Maxwell's embezzlement. Hoffenberg went to prison, but no charges against Epstein. Ophelia says, Epstein is finishing up plastic surgery in Brazil, then on to his hideaway. And Douglas Lund says, the U.S. is Sodom and Gomorrah, the U.S. government the most evil government on earth. And Martin Mohn says, Epstein will be watching this from a yacht somewhere. Well, let's take some uh, calls. Tamar, have you got any calls for me?
line one. Is that Amal Ibrahim? Yes, hello. Well, let me, before you start talking, let me uh, break some news about you. Amal Ibrahim is running for the presidency of Somalia. Her manifesto is this. Somalia, a country that desperately needs stability and peace, a country that millions of people had to leave behind when the presidential elections took place in Somalia in 2012, one of the candidates was from Finland. Amal left Somalia with her family when she was 17 years old, and they ended up in Finland. 20 years later, this practical nurse with five children wants to return to her home country as president. What a remarkable story. Amal, very, very welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you, George. My name is Amal Ibrahim, and uh, I'm going to Somali president uh, next month, inshallah. And uh, Somalia How many candidates? Go. How many candidates are running against you? Uh, there was uh, 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 15, one five. Okay. Candidate uh, are running. Are you running for a party or as an independent? I'm, I'm uh, independent. I'm speaking for women and children. They are suffering there, a lot of problems. Last three years, our government genocide their people. Every day, bomb is going on, and uh, there is no food, no enough medicine, no enough education. We don't have nothing uh, at the country. People are dying. 28,000 people are dying last three years. So we need some changing. We cannot uh, see what's happening in our country, and we are witness uh, genocide of our people. That's, n that's not a good way. We have to make a change right now before it's too late. I mean, it goes without saying that there's never been a woman president of Somalia. Uh, no, it's, I'm uh, not the it, I think you're even, are you even the first woman to run for the job? Yes, I'm the first woman. Well, that is a fantastic achievement in itself, however you do in the uh, elections. How is your candidacy being received uh, by the people, uh, by the men, uh, by the media? Uh, by the people now, and I want the media and all everyone in the UK and all over the world. I want their supporting to helping me uh, to make a change. Uh, Somali men, is they are, last 30 years, they are fighting and uh, genocide every day is going on and uh, everyone wanted to revenge other people. So we need woman ideology to change that situation in Somalia. We need new life, new start up and forget what is behind civil war. Is Somalia ready for that change, do you think? Yes, if a woman comes there, uh, we forget. We have to move on. Last 10 years, we are fighting each other and nobody's winning. So we have to forget and we must move on next level because our people are dying and children and women are suffering too much. For, for them, we have to do better life and better change in the country. But one of the main reasons for, not the only one, but one of the main reasons for the extraordinary instability and huge suffering and death in Somalia is the Islamist fanatics, uh, the Al-Qaeda affiliate there. Uh, they presumably are not that happy, a woman running for president. They are happy. They want to change it. They, uh, every person asks me if we get a woman. No, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking about the Shabab, the Al-Qaeda yeah, affiliate. Al they they must Shabab, hate the they idea. They don't like a woman. They don't no. like a woman. But, but we are suffering 30 years. They are not rule anymore. We but, need a change. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, but they still pack uh, quite a formidable punch. Their terrorist activities are ongoing. They, are not, they don't have a, now they're going down, they, do, they don't have enough uh, financial and, and they, they are not strong like before. Really? 
Now, yes. the other uh, big problem, I recall, I made a speech on, uh, on uh, Somalia, actually, in Parliament. You can see it on YouTube. Uh, I, I knew more then than I do now because it's some time since I thought uh, about these issues. But one of the things I highlighted in that speech was the Ethiopian aggression against Somalia. What's the situation there now with uh, your uh, more powerful neighbor? Yes, uh, more powerful neighbor. They need someone who understand the kind of politic they are playing. They need uh, some act, uh, actors who understand their situation. They want to take Somali petrol. That is their main issue that they are going there. Ethiopia and Kenya, both. Both Ethiopia our and Kenya. Our neighbor is, but they want to take our resource. So we must stop them. So have you moved your family from Finland to Somalia or are you, are you there on your own for the minute? I'm going there my own first and make uh, their home ready and then after they come in. It'll be a big change from Finland. And now I'm in London. You're in London now, but your, your children have uh, not been uh, brought up in Somalia. How do you think they'll cope with the with the many, many differences they're going to experience. Yes, sometimes they need uh, to understand their culture and where they come from, so... Uh, well, look, it's, uh, uh, the it's very, very good uh, the to, very, uh, to learning. The, the very best of luck uh, to you. Can you uh, keep us uh, posted uh, when you get there? Uh, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll talk again as your campaign yeah, uh, goes ahead. How, when is polling day? Uh, the, uh, I want to go in September. And when is the voting? But, but I want to voting here. Some uh, I want to, you uh, UK support me you want, financial uh, you, and you, you yeah. Want, yeah. Do do Somalis in Britain have a vote? They cannot vote there because only Parliament is voting. Okay, but now not, not, we don't not have one man one vote system. Yeah, we don't have one. more one man one vote system yet our government is very weak and that this is uh, only parliament can make it changing okay well keep us posted yeah i'm interested to know how you do that's uh, amal ibrahim uh, out of the blue she called just to tell us that she's a candidate for president in somalia tony is on the line let's hear from him tony Good evening, George. I can confirm that I am not standing for president of Somalia. No, by no, but, but by the way, <laughs> but by the way, the woman is living in Merseyside at the moment, so maybe she, really? should, maybe she should try out for the mayor of Liverpool first. After all, they've got, <laughs> after all, they've got plenty of those. Anyway, go ahead, Tony. Well, George, I was going to touch on the uh, China issue, and I think there are a number of reasons why the Americans are particularly afraid of China. If you look at the purchasing power parity index now, China's economy is essentially worth around 27 trillion per year. Um, at the same time, we're seeing de-dollarization around the world and a threat to the dollar as a world's reserve currency, um, particularly from obviously the Chinese currency, the yuan or the rimbi. Um, then you've also got the issue with uh, Huawei. Now, there's a, there's a very uh, real reason why the United States don't want Huawei to have any inroads into, the, into Western Europe and the UK in particular. And that's because the NSA like to, um, shall we say, embed some malware. Yeah, such as, um, they, such want, as, they want to control all the back doors. Yeah, yeah it's, it's about the operating systems. They want the back doors to the operating system so that they can embed such malware as the likes of Umbridge. I'm sure you know all about Umbridge, George. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's been well uh, discussed in the past. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's a serious issue for the United States because, as has been touched on, China buys lots of U.S. debt bonds, and they also um, invest heavily in the U.S. economy. So this trade war goes much you know, beyond where we are now, shall we say, in theory. It would, obviously, it would hurt China. It would hurt China, but let's be honest, they, they, they've been used to it before. I'm not sure the United States could face or is in a situation economically. We spoke about their debt levels last week. I'm not sure that they are in a situation where they could actually stand up to, you know, catastrophic 
downturn in that economy because well, I China agree is, with you, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 like our guest, would be an advocate of China selling these bonds Absolutely. and using the proceeds to uh, dramatically develop their own domestic market. After all, it's not a small domestic market; it's a billion and a half people. Well, that, that's right. That's right, George. And the thing is, obviously, if China stops buying the debt bonds, basically the Fed is going to have to buy back its own bonds. So yeah. it's going to be printing bonds and buying them back. Yeah. So, uh, it's a catastrophic situation, and I think that's why the Americans are absolutely petrified of the situation they're in now. And, but know, then, why the, do they why do they continually provoke China, knowing that China has this nuclear option? Uh, of simply dumping America's debt. Because I think, George, they're also seeing at the same time China's military is being built up in a, in a huge way, um, and it's certainly high-tech now, uh, along with the Russians have done it, the Iranians in particular as well. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're well aware of what the Iranians are, have done in, in the past five years, particularly you, you look at the, the drone fleet. I think they are now the, the fifth largest drone power in the world now, Iran. And, you know, a lot of their technology, obviously, they've taken from the CIA. You know, they've, you know the likes of the, the RQ-170 RQ uh, Sentinel drone, which was obviously taken from the CIA, which they landed in Iran, which was flying a, across the Iranian borders, and they, they basically hacked into it, landed it within the Iranian territory, and then they reverse-engineered it, and that's what the Iranians have been very clever at doing. And the, the Chinese have done that, too. You know, you know, intellectual property rights and all that, they've all done that. So they've, basically they've caught up with the West because they haven't had to spend so much money on research and development because they, they've basically been taking um, intellectual property rights. And obviously they've been utilising that very, very, very smartly, you might say, illegally also, you might say, but they have caught up in, in, in a really quick fashion with, with the West. Um, if, if we go on to infrastructure, George, it, the United States, they're looking at China, and China in the next five years, they're going to build 30 brand new airports from scratch in five years, and they're expanding 60 other existing airports, and they also have bullet trains. Now, you've been to the United States, George. Have you ever set, uh, set eyes on a bullet train no, in the no. United States? No, neither, it, neither there nor here. Exactly. It, it's all about infrastructure. Now, we, we're constantly going around the world telling everybody you must be like us. Well, our infrastructure is crumbling. The bridges are terrible, airports are terrible, the roads are terrible. If you go to Russia, if you go to Iran, if you go to China, if you go to other parts of the, you know, the Middle East, certainly like the, the UAE, you go to Qatar, I've worked around the Middle East and Africa Kuwait, as well. Kuwait's doing very well now. Kuwait's doing very well as well. And even if you go to Africa, George, I think I've worked in West Africa quite a lot. If you go to Africa now, I think you're looking at around about Eight, eight to ten of the, the most expensive cities in the world are now in Africa. Oh, people are amazed by that, but that's true. And it's because of the oil and the gas industry that's expanding there too. And this is where de-dollarization comes into it. The Americans are losing so much traction because they can't now bully people with the dollar because of the, the, uh, the preeminence of the, the Chinese currency. Uh, and obviously the Russians as well. Well, look, that's all very fascinating, Tony, and I'm grateful to you for it. Alas, I need to take a break for the news and I'll be back with Adam, the cleverest man in England. Hashtag Ask Adam after the break. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. This is Dominic Carter, a political reporter in New York for Verizon Files TV News. This is Dr. Bill Honigman, a progressive Democrat for America, PD, America.org. Hey, everybody, my name is Tim Black of the Tim Black Show. This is Tom Luongo of Gold Coast and Guns. Hello, this is Benny Johnson. Hi, this is Juanita Broderick, author of You'd Better Put Some Ice on That. This is Jamal Thomas from the Progressive Soapbox. Hey, this is Raheem from D.C. This is Rachel Blevins, a correspondent with RT America, and you're listening to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. When I'm waking up in the morning, I'm looking for what's on the queue for today. I tune to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. The wokest radio show for your wokest AM. These guys are the best in the business and experts when it comes to policy. They're bringing you the top headlines with an angle that you won't see in the mainstream media. 
Fall Lines is the greatest show on the radio. I enjoy immensely talking with Lee and Garland. They always treat me uh, from either side with due respect, and it's a wonderful conversation. The best morning news show in America. Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. Lee and Garland speak truth to power from the depths of the swamp itself, right here on Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Sputnik News. Earlier this week, the Iranian oil tanker Grace One was given permission to leave Gibraltar after spending a month in detention following its seizure by the UK Marines. Commenting on the decision, Iranian Navy Commander Admiral Hussein Khazandzi said Iran was ready, if necessary, to send warships to escort the Iranian tanker. On Friday, the US Justice Department issued a warrant for the seizure of the Iran supertanker. According to the document, the vessel, all the oil on board, and $995,000 US dollars are subject to forfeiture based on violations of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or the IEPA, bank fraud, money laundering and terrorism forfeiture statuses. Gibraltar's authorities later confirmed that Washington had made a last-ditch last request to seize the tanker on a number of allegations. On the 15th of August, Israel banned Rashid Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, two U.S. congresswomen, from visiting the West Bank and Jerusalem over their professed support for boycotting Israel. Tlaib filed, a, Tlaib filed a request to be allowed to visit her grandmother on humanitarian grounds and subsequently received permission, yet demonstratively rejected the offer to go. Israeli politician Nir Barkat said on Friday that Tlaib had proved her real intentions for her visit, according to the Jerusalem Post. Barkat tweeted to Tlaib that she intended to use her 90-year-old grandmother to wage political war, calling for Israel's destruction and boycott. Barkat also wrote to Rashid Atleb and Republic, uh, Rep Representative Ilhan Omar on Twitter on Thursday that their views did not belong in Israel. And finally, the White House economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, has fueled this week's social media craze around President Donald Trump's desire to acquire Greenland by saying he would not mind adding the Danish Autonomous Territory to the United States. Greenland, a key Danish territory that is rich in mineral resources and hydrocarbons, shot to Twitter twins on Thursday after the Wall Street Journal reported, citing sources in the White House, that Trump had inquired about the possibility of purchasing the island. While some of the advisors have reportedly supported Trump's idea as economically attractive, others have voiced the belief that this is just a fleeting fascination of the president and is unlikely to materialize. The report comes just weeks ahead of Donald Trump's first trip to Denmark, scheduled for early September, which is said to be unrelated to the idea. I'm Tamar Osfahani. This is Radio Sputnik. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik, we speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. Tune in every Friday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a weekly segment of the worst mainstream media headlines of the week. They tell us what's behind the worst, most misleading, and funniest headlines from around the news with Steve Pat of the blog Left Eye on the News. Together, they pull apart the corporate media's bias, spin, and downright lies. Tune in this Friday and every Friday for the worst and most misleading headlines of the week. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com.
listening to Radio Sputnik. Sputnik. Telling the untold. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Only on Sputnik Radio. Did I hear that correctly, Adam, that Donald Trump is trying to buy Greenland? Well, those are certainly the reports, and it's, a, it's rich in minerals, it's sparse in its population, and I suppose it would be a much more wholesome island than Mr. Epstein's island, which former presidents didn't buy, but they certainly allegedly bought things on such an island. We live in because funny if times. He's in, if he's looking for real estate, I've got a bridge here in London I can <laughs> uh, sell him. You are uh, obviously right. I have been joined by the cleverest man in England. If you want to ask him a question about anything, from the uh, lineup of Banana Rama to <laughs> Einstein's theory of relativity and everything in between. Shout outs and compliments. Paul Booker, my week is nearing completion with my Sunday evening highlight, the wonderful mother of all talk shows. Nowhere but here with Gigi and his interesting and diverse weekly guests will you see and hear the truth about what's going on in the world today. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And Declan says, just loving tonight's monologue by George. Looking forward to the rest of the show. Hope you've enjoyed it, Declan. Uh, Lucha Libertaria says, this was recommended to me by YouTube. Sometimes YouTube recommendations work well. Hats off to YouTube. They're recommending us. And Nic Nicola Reed Lyons says, I don't mind a bit of George Galloway. He speaks a lot of sense. And Bill Bill says, if we don't have a world dictatorship, then how can the US tell the world they're not allowed to do business with Syria? Iran can do business with anyone they want. Alas, not so in today's world. Dia Gia says, who hijacks a ship at sea? Pirates. And that is what they are. Pirates flying the Jolly Roger. And J.A. says, the goals of capitalism are to make capital. And so, if a community is ill-educated, has little chance of creating something new out of raw materials or of inventing a new idea. And Christina asks or says, in countries throughout the world, there are incidents to be ashamed of in their history. It indicates that people of bad character got into positions of power and authority. The mainstream media have facilitated covering up for people of bad character in power. And Kira McColgan says, Mrs. Ibrahim sounds like a good strong woman, as indeed she did. Diogenes, the horse fan, says, so is criminality not possible in communism? It certainly is, Diogenes. And Francis Cheyenne says this Somalian woman is incredibly inspirational. Yes. My gosh, talk about being against all the odds. God, Allah, whoever, bless her and be with her. Welcome, Adam. Thank you. There's no show without you, the cleverest man in England. I've got a raft of questions uh, flowing in for you. Christina asks, can you clarify, is Kashmir more left-wing or right-wing? That shows how many people still see issues through a prism which is, uh, well, very last century. Uh, but also, w what is meant by the terms left-wing and right-wing? Actually, if you look back at the basis of those terms and then compare it with uh, the prevailing conditions in politics today, in a way they've reversed. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, if you're in favor of NATO, in favor of nuclear weapons, in favor of invading other people's countries, in favor of Hillary Clinton, <laughs> in favor of Tony Blair, you're not left-wing, in my opinion, and if that is left-wing, I ain't left-wing, bruv. Mm. Well, the, the whole notion of left and right dates back to the French Revolution, and the seating arrangements in their assembly were those of a more radical point of view, sat on the left side of the chamber, and those opposite, who were a bit more uh, middle of the road, sat on the right. So I think the French Revolution being an event well in the past, we really ought to move beyond these labels, not least because, as you say, 
the classical definitions that us children of the 20th century grew up with, they really no longer apply in the 21st well, at they, all. They really don't. I mean, for example, uh, there are people who regard themselves as being left-wing who are absolutely, let's take, I'll, I'll name names, Paul Mason. Mm -hmm. He's a fanatic for NATO. He's a fanatic for the EU. So how can that be left-wing? Well, it's what, if we can self-identify our sex, nationality, gender and race, I suppose we can redefine and self-define left-wing and right-wing, but I'm, I'm actually quite happy to see these old shibboleths of left and right crumble and become meaningless, so meaningless where one can call oneself something and advocate for policies that don't quite stack up with that label. The reason I'm happy about that is because if we take things on an issue-by-issue -issue basis, I think we'd be a lot further ahead head than say, I'm on that side of the chamber, or I'm on that side of the chamber. There's a, uh, there's a quote that uh, you've mentioned in the past on our various programs, which is, if you sit by the river long enough, you will see the bodies of all your enemies float past. Well, I try to think of 21st century politics in the following way. If you listen to someone long enough, you're bound to agree with them eventually. And <laughs> inversely, if you're listening to someone that you're prepared to agree with, and if you listen to such a person long enough, you'll probably find areas of difference sooner rather than later. And for me, that's refreshing. There's nothing worse than the tyranny of consensus, the tyranny of sameness. And so I say the more diversity, the better. And breaking down these monoliths of left and right, I think will open up a chasm where ideas will float past and we can grab them up as they do. Or as uh, Dong Ping put it, it doesn't matter if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. One of my favourite statements from one of my favourite men. Now, I've got a call uh, on the line, line two, I think, uh, in Germany. Sorry, I didn't catch your name, caller. Frank in Germany. Frank, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, I've got a question. Uh, I'd like to know where do you stand on the matter of degrowth, by which I mean the need to degrow our Economies. De degrow. In order for the rest you mean of the world to you mean catch ne up. You mean negatively grow? Yes, that's what I mean. Adam. Well, how do I feel about economies that are shrinking? No, uh, the gentleman's asking, how do I feel about degrowth, uh, which is uh, an argument that some people make that the rich countries have got to, as a matter of deliberate policy, have to reduce their growth to the negative uh, in order that other people in the world can catch up. I'm not a fan of that oh, it's, myself. It's, what a load uh, of rubbish. The, no, total load of rubbish. Wealth is created, created as a product of labor. People that labor, whether they're in Singapore, in Germany, in Russia, in Mongolia, in South Africa, in Nicaragua, they're all laboring and they create things. Those creations, when the market finds them prudent, when society finds them valuable, generates wealth. There's an unlimited potential to generate wealth, which incidentally is totally different than generating money. Money exists whether we manipulate it or not. And when governments do manipulate it, they tend to get regular people into a lot of trouble. But wealth as such is a product of creation. It's bought, it's sold, it's made. And there's an unlimited potential and for used. every country. It's used. Absolutely. It has utility. Indeed, very much so. Something that we quite, as I did just there, we forget. We tend to forget that. Yeah, so yeah, there's, there's no, there's, it's total nonsense that someone needs to get poor in order for someone else to grow rich. Right, so, uh, Frank, uh, are, you a, are you an advocate of that line of degrowth? Yes, I am, because I think there is no one to, uh, to create wealth. I agree with Adam that uh, actually making things create wealth, but you need energy to do so. And I think energy will be up to them. Apart from anything else, Frank, you could never convince an electorate to vote for a government <laughs> that wanted to make them poorer so that others could catch up. I'm right on that. No, no. Unless, unless Germany's changed a bit. Yeah, I agree with you totally. You know, we'll, we'll get on that train. On that. Sorry, it's a bad line, Frank, uh, but a good call. Thank you very much indeed for making it. Here's Jared in Pennsylvania. Always uh, welcome. Jared, go ahead. Uh, hello, George, and hello, Adam. How are you? Um, 
um, uh, interesting fact: my older brother is also named Adam. So this is a, kind of is an he, interesting call very, here. Is he very clever? Yes, he is. Actually, he reads <laughs> books all the time. You Excellent. should see his room; it's a library. Okay, good. <laughs> so is Adams. No, I've seen his room. Right. I want to quickly ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a drum and a cymbal um, when I need one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, first, um, solidarity with uh, Kashmir. And uh, second, um, could you, just a guest re recommendation real quick. Could you have on Robbie Martin, the brother of Abby Martin, on your show? Abby Martin has a brother? Yet? Yeah. You didn't know that? I didn't. Is he anything like as good as her? Yes. This well, I good. find that hard to believe because she is the queen for me. And if there's another Martin uh, that can rival her, uh, what does he do then? He makes documentaries about the neoconservatives. Wow. Is he older or younger than her? Uh, slightly older. Okay. They were both born around the 1980s. My goodness, their parents must be proud of them. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I, it's, 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 it definitely must be uh, interesting to have a younger sister who is that talented and an older brother who um, is such a um, renowned filmmaker. Well, I'll tell you uh, what. Calling I'll, out I'll, the I'll, I'll make a deal with you, Jared. Uh, we'll make a point of booking. Robbie Martin, brother of the great princess of the left, Abby Martin. Thanks for that call. I've got someone in New York. Who is it, Tamar? Christopher uh, in New York. Go ahead. Hello, George. Uh, thank you for, uh, for taking my call. Welcome, sir. I was going to make a comment about the Epstein autopsy, which I believe uh, is suspect. Uh, they found his hyoid bone and several other bones in his neck were broken Yeah. Uh, as a result of uh, hanging himself in a cell. But uh, I've read a few things about jailhouse suicides. I looked it up since I was on the subject. And uh, they normally would tie one end of his bed sheet to the post of the bed yeah. and just lean forward. It slowly cuts off the blood to your yeah. brain. You die painlessly and rather quickly yeah. without suffering. Yeah. It would seem strange bear, that bear in mind that he, Yeah, bear in mind that he is six or was six foot tall and the height of the bed no. uh, did not allow for any kind of uh, trapdoor effect, or any kind of, what's the word I'm looking for, the jolt that normally breaks bones in people's necks, indeed breaks the spinal cord. There was no question of that. Even if he did commit suicide, it was by strangulation rather than by any kind of abrupt drop. Yes. Yes. He, and he also, his, his lawyer uh, uh, stated that he had seen him on Friday and he, the, Jeffrey Epstein's last words to him were, I'll see you next see, week. I'll see you on you Sunday. Yeah, I'll see, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, uh, the fact that the lawyer rejects that he committed suicide is uh, more than enough for me. And it, it ought to be more than enough for everyone. If the man's legal representative on earth is saying this story is not right, cannot be right, surely everyone has a responsibility to demand a proper investigation. Yes, absolutely. And uh, that woman, uh, Giselle, I think you said you knew her, knew her father. Ghislaine. Oh, Ghislaine. I'm sorry, yeah. Ghislaine. New is yeah. an interesting choice of word. New, yes. Uh, I didn't uh, know him so much as bring about, help bring about his downfall. Uh, but I did know him, yes. I yeah. did know him. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, he called his boat the Lady Ghislaine precisely because she was his favorite child. And she was his favorite child because she was the most like him. Uh, even physically, even facially, uh, she is the most like him. Character is the most like him. And who knows, maybe she had the same connections as him. Can I just ask you, Chris, what's the, yes. 
What's the media in New York saying? You've got some pretty brash newspapers uh, in New York. Are they going along with the official narrative? They're, they seem to be going along with the official narrative, although they say with one eyebrow raised, you know, as to, as to say that they really, as they're telling the story, that they themselves really don't believe it. Yeah. What you about know, the, 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 uh, the New York Post? Uh, that, that's usually quite iconoclastic. Have they bought into the official narrative too? I, I think as the official story, as the not close trouble, I think they have. I mean, from the last story I read, anyway. Uh -huh. And what they, about, they the, seem, is the Daily News still going? The Daily News is still going. Maxwell but, uh, owned that. Maxwell owned that once, didn't he? I didn't know that. No, yeah, I didn't know that. It, either the, the Post or the Daily News. I think it was the Daily News. I'll have that checked. Uh, but Robert Maxwell owned that once, I think. Ah. You see, everything Rupert Murdoch did, Maxwell tried to do, except do it less well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so funny how the, uh, the wealthy and the powerful buy up newspapers to sway public opinion. Well, uh, they do it Kane. successfully. Yeah, Citizen Kane. Everyone wants to be a Citizen Kane. Chris, thank you yeah. very much indeed for joining us from New York. Let's take a break. Breaking news, expert analysis, and exclusive stories, all in one place. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik, we speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com. Tune in every Friday to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for a weekly segment of the worst mainstream media headlines of the week. They tell us what's behind the worst, most misleading, and funniest headlines from around the news with Steve Pat of the blog Left Eye on the News. Together, they pull apart the corporate media's bias, spin, and downright lies. Tune in this Friday and every Friday for the worst and most misleading headlines of the week. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at sputniknews.com. I'm here with the cleverest man in England, and you can ask him any question, and I mean any question, from Banana Rama to the theory of relativity. I know because I have done so. Chris says, Adam, I'm detecting an East Beirut accent. Are you from the same neighborhood as Doogie? <laughs> <laughs> well, the two of us grew up together. Uh, we have uh, different opinions of this show, but we're both equally enthusiastic, and I suppose I shall be sharing a shawarma with him somewhere in the Midlands <laughs> very shortly. Very good, in the black country. Uh, uh, should now, we explain the inside joke to people? <laughs> uh, perhaps not. It might take too long. Yes. Let's go to Long Beach, California. Who wouldn't want to? Go ahead. Hey, George. Hey, Adam. How are you? Good. Very What's your name, sir? You? Well, sir, I have a question for you. Go ahead. There's, for me, there's always been a weird symbiotic relations between the division of uh, India and the division of Palestine. And so I guess, so in my point of view, in the 47 division of uh, British Indians of Pakistan in India, kind of was an argument or justification for the later 1948 division of Palestine into Jewish and Arab enclaves. So fast forward, ever since its inception, the Israeli government has been, you know, an incremental land grab with every few years a big land grab uh, to ethnically cleanse and basically eliminate, push out the Palestinian people. So the question is this, is Mr. Modi trying to copy that template in Kashmir or worse, is he simply trying to provide cover for his really friends in Gaza and the West Bank? What a clever question from Long Beach, California. 
Uh, Adam, one for you, I think. Well, long before Israel existed as a modern state, there was a Hindutva ideology within what was then British India, which stressed that in order for India to be free, it not only needed to be free of its colonial ruler, a totally legitimate uh, theory and request, but it also, under this thinking, needed to be free of its own indigenous minorities, including Muslims, including Sikhs, including Christians, including including Jews, including downcast people, the Dalits. And this was a thinking that became the foundation of the party of Narendra Modi today, the BJP. And its sister organization, the RSS, actually helped to ethnically cleanse the Muslims of Jammu in October of 1947, before India was an official independent state, and likewise before Pakistan was. So what ha is happening today in Kashmir and what has been happening time and again from 47 up to the present day has its roots in something from the first quarter of the 20th century. So in that sense, the historical basis in terms of analyzing the difference between the Israel-Palestine conflict and the Kashmir conflict is different. But in terms of the optics, as the kids say, and in terms of the actual events on the ground, it's quite similar in that a, a nuclear-armed army is targeting a group of civilians that have no real access to the outside world. The difference being journalists do go to Palestine. There is social media coming out of Palestine. Physically, Palestine isn't isolated from the rest of the world, but Kashmir is even more so, much more so, I should say, a cocoon of total violence, a blackout, a place where blood flows, but nobody knows from whence it is flowing. So it's the two different situations the overall optics do have some similarities and as and as the caller said the Modi and Netanyahu happen to be very close friends and people can extrapolate from that reality what they like. Now the RSS were the people who murdered Gandhi of course. Indeed they were indeed they were and they were shunned by the Congress party of Nehru and the Nehru Gandhi dynasty which ruled over India for the f initial decades of its independence and many more hence. No there is a similarity with uh, Israel in that, in that the extremists who uh, blew up the King David Hotel yes. in Jerusalem, who uh, who murdered Lord Moyne, yes. uh, who tried to murder Winston Churchill when he was trying to defeat Adolf Hitler in the Second World War, uh, and so on. Uh, these extremists were shunned after 1948. Four decades uh, when uh, the so-called Israel Labour Party and its allies were ruling. But they've become hegemonic in uh, Israeli uh, society now, the revisionist uh, 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 people who were once marginal in Israel are now the top dogs. And the same is true in India. Well, that's absolutely right. And the two sides to this argument, so I'll present them both for the sake of transparency. There's one side in both uh, South Asia and in the Levant that says that the so-called secular and pluralistic parties in India and Israel, respectively, were the gentlemanly mosque over the monstrous face. Then there's another argument that says two countries that had every potential to be pluralistic, to be engaged with minorities, to shun the violence of the past were taken over by the werewolves that came out of the woodwork. Uh, I'm sure the audience will have uh, various perspectives on which one of those camps they fit into, but both of those arguments I don't think will ever go away in respect of conversations about both of those conflicts. Rashid, last word to you, sir. Both of you, uh, since your knowledge of the subcontinent, what's the logical way forward for the Imran Khan government? Adam? Well, the logical way forward is to use soft power to the utmost. The Palestinians, to the credit of their supporters, have been very good at shaping the debate, getting themselves in the headlines. Sometimes not positive headlines, certainly not in the late Mr. Maxwell's papers, uh, but nevertheless they're in the headlines. The great travesty with Kashmir is that decades of aloof Pal uh, Pakistani governments have made the issue go away. They've buried it in 
silence. Over the last week, I've seen an awakening amongst PTI, the ruling party of Pakistan, of Imran Khan. I've seen them taking to social media in English, the, the global language, and putting forth the argument that what Modi is doing is he's trying to create what Hitler called Lebensraum. He's advocating a, a unilateral supremacist ideology that needs to be stood up to. They got the issue to be discussed at the UN for the first time in decades. And so Pakistan isn't going to start a war. Some patriotic Pakistanis would want what they would call a war of liberation, but PTI's government isn't going to do that. But what they are doing and what they need to do much more is tell the world about Kashmir. Modi has eliminated any possible ambiguity about his goals, and now it's time for Pakistan to tell the Kashmiri story because they obviously can't tell it themselves. Thanks, Rashid. Ali's on the line. Go ahead, Ali. Hey, George. Uh, yes, Mr. sir. Where, where, where are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Belgium, but I'm Dutch. Okay, welcome. Well, I would like you to clarify your position on Brexit because it's not very clear to me. Because uh, for as much as I know, you want the Brexit to go on. So is it a no-deal Brexit? Do you want a new deal or do you want to just uh, move on as we're going ahead right now? Just like... Well, for the next five years, just well, Ali, move on and... Yeah. Well, Ali, with all respect to you, uh, there can be nothing about me that is more clear uh, than my position on Brexit. Uh, I my have, apologies. I, no, I have spoken about it ad nauseum and uh, search of Google, of YouTube and so on and, uh, and of the... But I want to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. What is I, I know you do. Do you but want the, a new deal? I, I, know, I know you do, but the hour is late. I'm just uh, giving an excuse for a brief answer because we can't spend the uh, remaining moments uh, on that. Here's my answer. I want to leave the European Union, uh, not least because the majority of people in the referendum voted for it, and so my uh, opposition to the European Union is now buttressed by my belief in democracy, and because we voted for it, we must do it. We must do it by Halloween. Uh, and if not, then the ghouls and the ghosts uh, will be chased by the people. Uh, as to whether we make a deal uh, on exit is a matter for you in the European Union. We, Britain, are quite ready to make a deal. Uh, it's the European Union that refuses to negotiate a deal different to the one thrice rejected by the British Parliament that Mrs. May brought back. So if you're insisting on a thrice rejected uh, deal as being your only negotiating uh, position, then I'm afraid we will leave with no deal, but leave we will, with a deal or without one. Preferably with a deal, if necessary, without one. Now, I don't mean to be uh, offensive in any way, to people in Belgium it. or in Holland, uh, but we have faced much worse things in our recent history uh, than leaving the trading block uh, that you are living in without a deal. Our country was on fire. Our soldiers uh, were uh, beached at Dunkirk. Uh, we brought them back, and then in 1944, we successfully uh, landed again on the European continent. Our people's lifeblood was given in the liberation of France, the liberation of Belgium, the liberation of Holland. Uh, so, you know, we are not anybody's pushover. And if anybody is counting in the EU on us buckling uh, because of the prospect that we can't get uh, French cheese uh, or, uh, or Dutch cheese, or, or Belgian waffles, or any of the other things that I, I you sell us, cheese. don't Absolutely. imagine that we're going to buckle. Our decision is final. We are leaving the European Union, preferably with a deal, 
but if necessary, without one Adam. Well, as they would say in a place that you're familiar with, I associate myself with the remarks of the honorable gentleman. Uh, there's not much to add to that other than my own opinion, since the general question was asked. I think that Britain should leave uh, on a no-deal basis and then go for a free trade agreement, just as if the EU was any other bloc of nations. I think Britain should have a free trade agreement with many nations, and the EU 27 are one of them. I think they've got to get off their high horse and realize that they should see Britain as a simple free trading opportunity for the future, the same way they did, for example, with Japan, with whom Brussels just signed an FTA. Sorry, Ali, got to take a break. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we give you the most essential information out there. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Tune in Tuesdays to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker for Women in Society with Professor Hannah Dickinson, where we talk about the major issues, challenges, and struggles facing women in all aspects of society. Hannah Dickinson, professor and organizer with the Geneva Women's Assembly, joins the show this Tuesday and every Tuesday on Loud and Clear. It's time to double down with Max and Stacy. Yeah, double down. We're talking markets, finance, business, economics, ka-ching, bling, just about everything money related on Sputnik. It's called Double Down. We're asking, are dead cats bouncing or have fundamentals changed? That's this week on Double Down. Radio Sputnik. We speak your language. Find us at SputnikNews.com. The mother of all talk shows. Join our faculty of legends, contributors, and callers. Everyone is welcome. Want to talk? Get in touch with us at radio at SputnikNews.com. Well, obviously, our new U.S. number is working, 001757-744-4480, because Joseph in Louisiana is about the fourth American caller uh, in the last half hour. Joseph. Yes, sir. Nice to hear well, from you. Go ahead. We're having, an we're having an interesting week here in America. We're having an interesting week. We have all these mass shootings, which are very strange. Looks like MK Ultra little children, a bunch of weirdo kids with glasses. I don't know what's going on really, but we we're very, it's very strange. The shootings and then Epstein being killed and Julian Assange being locked away and silenced. I think the same people that are silencing Julian Assange are the same people that choked Epstein. Well, are you convinced that he was choked at the very least? They allowed him to choke himself. It's inconceivable oh, sure. that all the prison guards fell asleep at the same time. Uh, I mean, if you believe that, you'll believe anything. How much money? How much money they saved in killing Epstein? Could you imagine all the scientists? I think half of Google, half of Facebook would probably wind up in jail. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, they can't have that. They can't have uh, you know our politicians who like to sniff children going to jail. We can't have half of our military who's been running drugs up and down our highways and their vehicles. Stop blaming the Mexicans for all that heroin that's killing my kids. It's impossible that that amount of heroin can come across that border and kill all these kids. Impossible. All this is connected. Who do you think wants your guns? But the people who are poisoning you and lying to you and molesting your kids and telling your kids to go this way instead of that way. It's why your families are falling apart. It's why we have all these people coming into our countries, destroying our sovereignty. Because the globalists who are pulling the strings have been pulling the strings for over 100 years. And now for the past 30, they've beaten their drum, and now they have us by the throat. We can't tell the truth anymore. We can't come out of the closet to say what has happened to us as our children when we were abused by whatever. You take your choice. You can go with the Catholics. You can go with the Boy Scouts. You can go with half and half of, I don't care, Disneyland, whatever. I mean, how many pedophiles are out there? 
<laughs> well, uh, quite a few, uh, uh, quite a few, and as I know to my personal cost, they didn't uh, begin yesterday or in the last few no, uh, it, years. No, this is a, a um, thousand years ago. A thousand-year-old beast has now come to roost in our house and in our eyes. They promote their ways every day in the media. They promote in the children's uh, cartoons now. Take away the guns. Take away the guns. You know, they promote it in the everyday television here in America. You'll see them talk about take away the guns. Take away the guns. Well, look, uh, jo Joseph. Finally, uh, Donald Trump ran for election. Uh, on a platform of draining the swamp. He hasn't really done that, has he? Has he retained your support? He hasn't. What happened was we gave him power. Us YouTubers, us conspiracy theorists, all of us who have been silenced on YouTube now, Julian Assange, people like Edward Snowden, true digital warriors. We all stood up because we wanted Hillary in jail because we know she's a murderer. We know she's killed many of our federal agents and our families here in America, and no one will stand up for us, just like no one would stand up for others. They didn't listen to Malcolm X because he was educated and black. The blacks didn't listen to him because they thought he sounded white and he was educated. The whites didn't listen to him because he was black. And if it all missed to him, we'd all be okay today, probably. Okay, look, Joseph, uh, that's uh, quite a litany of charges you've uh, made. Obviously, I can't stand over them all uh, because uh, I don't have uh, the evidence to do so. But you've had your uh, say. Thanks uh, very much for the call. King Ghidorah says, since the 1st of August, we have seen stocks plunging and gold going up. Do you or Adam have any idea what is ahead for us? Well, it's going to be a big crash around the whole world, isn't there? Well, all of the signs are there. And the reason for it is because when you've got a fiat money system that's based on a house of cards, which is really just a house of debt, you create the bubble and all you're going to do is managing the time when it bursts. The more you put off the moment of explosion or perhaps implosion is the better word, the worse and the more cataclysmic the bang is. The only silver lining in the short term I can see is that if Trump makes a trade deal with China, which based on his very recent tweets he very much wants to do, things might get pulled back a bit. The structural flaws in the system, in the financial status quo, won't change, but it will put off the disaster for at least a bit longer. The markets will breathe a sigh of relief, but as the lady says, whenever the markets are looking dodgy, whenever, a cra whenever all the indicators from an inverted yield curve to a tumbling of the Dow Jones and the Nasdaq and the S&P, whenever these, this writing is on the wall, people go into gold, because however much the Fed tries to distort the price of gold with naked short sales, gold has a way of always ultimately telling the truth. And when you look at who's going into gold, the rising economies of Asia and the investors in the West who are now spooked by the fact that what the Fed did for the people who want to flush money into the system seemed too little too late, Trump certainly thinks that, that it's all gone a bit awry. They're running into gold. It shouldn't shock anyone. Ken is in London, on the line. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, hiya there. Um, question for Adam. Yeah. Yes, um, kind of to do with what you were just talking about. Kind mm. of in uh, Denmark in the week, it was um, said that they was offering negative interest rates for kind of mortgages and things. So you'd kind of take out a mortgage and pay less than you actually kind of borrow. Is this, the, uh, is this a sign of the edge or the top of the bubble? Adam. Well, negative interest rates are disastrous because they're a symptom of central planners and central bankers giving up. Uh, you're essentially saying that we're so desperate for the illusion of money creation that we're going to create illusory money, which then creates uh, a seemingly real uh, upswing in the economy. But that, of course, is just a bubble. And the more we go on, the fewer people are biting. For example, when 
when the Fed lowered, did the supposedly modest lowering of rates the other week, that was supposed to make everyone confident. That was supposed to make the Dow Jones tiptoe up through the tulips uh, to reference another big asset bubble in Holland. Uh, but instead, people were wise to it. They realized that, and, and of course, we're not talking technically about negative interest rates in America, but they realized that what the Fed was doing was essentially trying to put lipstick on the pig of recession, and they didn't buy it. Uh, that's, it was after that that the Fed did the too little, too late uh, song and dance, that the yield curve on the bond market inverted, that the market started to take a huge plunge, and that the price of gold, which was already going up, it went up even higher. And you see gold going into China, going into Turkey, into India, into Russia. Uh, the other economies of the world, whether they're dynamos like China or those like Turkey, who are once bitten, twice shy about inflation, you could put Russia in that same category too. They know the score. And frankly, everyone ought to learn quick. I told you he was clever, didn't I? <laughs> uh, let's go to, I think we've got a US call. Uh, I didn't catch the name. Caller, welcome. Yeah, hello, George. Michael, nice to hear from you. Where are you? Washington State. Excellent. Go ahead, sir. I saw that thing about his lane over at um, that burger place. Uh -huh. And she was reading that book. And it occurred to me that his book contents titled Subject Matter was that maybe she's providing a message to the CIA like, you killed one of ours, we can kill one of yours. I don't know if she was involved. It's clearly a spoof, that picture, uh, because of the book and because of the Photoshop nature of it. Uh, there are all sorts of things. Adam knows a lot about it. Let me uh, put you on to Adam. Adam. Well, I was reading some of the forensic analysis in the Daily Mail, actually, um, earlier today, and they pointed out one glaringly uh, fraudulent piece of uh, a photography, um, to use a pun. What uh, a great line, <laughs> four, F-A-U-X, photography, uh, brilliant. Some, some will get it, many will try. <laughs> <laughs> but so, anyway, back to Earth. Um, there was a bus stop advert behind her, and um, it was for a film that's apparently either just come out or is coming out in the States called The Good Boys or something like that. Now, the, the clever guys at Fleet Street did their job, I don't usually say that, and they found out that not only has, has that advert not been at that bus stop any time recently, but that it's in fact never been up, and it was an advert for some sort of hospital service that was up during the time uh, that, uh, that Maxwell was allegedly sat there. There were several other inconsistencies in the photo. Uh, it was supposed to, the series of photos released was supposed to have taken place over a, a fairly short period of time, yet in the background behind her, several different uh, diners had come and gone in what's alleged to be a very short period of time. And finally, the food that was beside her in all that period of time wasn't even, it showed no visible signs of being touched, let alone consumed. It was and, a and those whopper, are, <laughs> Michael. It was a whopper. Indeed. <laughs> Jimmy Dore recognized the... Uh... Jimmy, Jimmy Dore's uh, Stephanie recognized the, uh, the, the location of it by what was behind it, and they talked about it a bit. Well, Jimmy but, Dore, I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy Dore is as uh, sharp as a razor. So if, uh, if he spotted it, uh, I'm sure that, uh, that that's correct. I mean, from what Adam has told me about the Daily Mail, I'm perfectly persuaded uh, that the picture is a spoof. Now, it could be as Whitney Webb uh, had, uh, I think, thought earlier that this was Ghislaine Maxwell spoof, that she was mocking no. uh, the people. But equally, it could be people with absolutely nothing to do with Ghislaine Maxwell who have launched this spoof. Having a laugh, trolls. Just having a laugh, trolls, yeah. What do you say, Michael? That's, that, that is interesting, and I, I would, because she had what had to have flown from the East Coast all the way to L.A., just like that, right, with her dog. <laughs> well, uh, the first story was that she was in Massachusetts on a, in a beachfront house with a boyfriend uh, who now denies that he's our boyfriend, denies that she is in the house or has been living there, but he is walking her dog. Uh, but she's apparently not there. And now we can say, I think, she's apparently not in Los Angeles, at least not in that burger joint. 
in Los Angeles. But the American government has to know where she is, Michael. Mutated into clickbait, I take it. Yeah, I think so. Look, thanks very much uh, for the call. Uh, I've got messages that I can't read from Uganda, Belfast, Australia, California, Texas, North Dakota, South Dakota, Netherlands, Maidenhead, Palm Springs, Liverpool, New York City, Hong Kong, Pennsylvania, Germany, Glasgow, and Bristol. And Lynn Leach says, looking forward to seeing you in Liverpool at the Linar Hotel in October. Thanks very much for that, uh, Lynn. That gives me the chance to recap. The mother of all talk shows, Rage Roadshow, continues. It will be in Liverpool at the Linar Hotel in October. It will be at the Sioux Townsend Theatre in Leicester in November and will be in East Kilbride at the Village Theatre uh, in January. Uh, additionally, I and my friend from UB40, Brian Travers, and the cleverest man in England, Adam Gary, will be appearing on Friday the 13th, Ooh. unlucky for some, <laughs> in West Brom at West Brom Community Centre. That one is admission free, so don't uh, uh, tarry, be there or be square. Morris McKinnon says, why can't Galloway be our Prime Minister? The guy for such a job is right here. We all know it. Thank you, my dear Morris. And Youth Views says, loving the show so far. Wait all week for this, George. Love it. And thanks for that. And Dahir Omar says, I'm watching the show, the Open University of the Airwaves, all the way in the capital of Kenya, Nairobi. Can I recommend a wonderful holiday destination for your viewers and listeners? Kenya, a beautiful country, friendly people, and lovely weather. Have you ever been in Kenya? No, I haven't been to Africa, no. Omar Elka says, this show has become one of my weekly highlights. Such an improvement over the old. Sometimes getting sacked is quite a blessing. Actually, uh, uh, Piers Morgan uh, said that to me on Good Morning Britain. He said, sacking is an opportunity. A sacking is an opportunity, and he was certainly right uh, in this case. And V. Kopenga says, the thing about Galloway is that despite, sorry, is that besides his amazing analysis of events, the events he talks about are often ones he was witness to. Mother of all talk shows is where to get a truly unique perspective, not just speculation. Thank you very much indeed for all those kind uh, messages. Uh, we haven't been able to get to many uh, of them. There have been literally hundreds, and I'm grateful to all of you, and I'm apologizing to those that we didn't get to, and indeed the callers that we haven't been able to uh, get to. Dave Kavanagh has a different view. Uh, Tibet, the foreign occupation, the forgotten occupation. George Galloway keeps talking of a post-Brexit trade deal. How can we trade with China under such circumstance? Just briefly, Tibet is one of the uh, pressure points on China, isn't it? Uh, but so far as I'm concerned, Tibet is as much a part of China as Hong Kong is. Where do you stand on that? Well, of course it's part of China. And prior to 1959, when there were human slaves sold in Tibet, when there was a system that was beyond feudal, it was totally archaic, uh, where the vast amount of wealth was uh, circulating within just a few handful of people. This isn't a 1%. We're talking about a 0.1%. And now it's become a normal part of China with its culture intact and indeed strengthened because now it can be enjoyed by the peasants who were toiling too much to even realize that they frankly had a unique and distinct culture. But getting back to the broader point, I don't believe that politicians should go looking for problems around the world and then inventing fake solutions which are themselves new problems. One doesn't go into... And advocating no trade with China because of <laughs> Tibet. Well, it, would be, absurd, it would be economic it? suicide, first of all, but it would be like going into a shop and asking what someone's religion and political 
political views and moral standing in the community, which is a word that the identitarians love, before you buy that Mars bar from the man behind the desk, you'd probably get done for some sort of racial prejudice. But somehow, when people of this neoliberal persuasion are involved with trade, that's okay. It's nonsense. Trade is about pragmatism. There are other areas where ethics come in, particularly in weapon sales. But if you're just buying a car or a boat or an aeroplane or a, or a, or a piece of, of, of a thing of barley or whatever, a bottle of wine, the, the moral thing doesn't really come into it. You've just got to be pragmatic. And it's always interesting to me that China is uniquely singled out in this. Not other countries with problems, not India because of Kashmir, um, not various not countries Saudi Arabia. indeed in the, and, um, and others in the Arab world, but China singled out because, frankly, people tend to dress up their very base and vulgar emotions with a lot of claptrap and humbug. I think people are jealous China's successful and they're jealous of China's success. Therefore, China's public enemy, number one, when they're, frankly, the workshop of the world, number one, soon to be the invention shop of the world. I find it terribly exciting. Now, no show is complete. A legend has appeared on the line. Yes, it's Norma in Bristol. Welcome, Norma. Hello, George. I must stop bringing you. But so I want to tell you. We, we, we well, wouldn't have I'm, a show without you. You're the I'm, most popular of all legends. <laughs> I'm privileged. Um, there's still an echo. I'm, I want to tell you about some strong memories that, that were for me about Hong Kong. Yes. Because my husband and I, we were on holiday in 1997, and unfortunately my husband had a major stroke there. Okay. Oh dear. So we were still there at the handover. Now, my point is, it was very interesting, but the um, six feet treatment he had at the hospital was absolutely marvellous. And the hotel at Shangri-La, I'm saying the name of it because they treated me like a sort of very special guest. And eventually a medical escort arrived from Bristol and took us home on the aircraft. And the thing is, there was this countdown to Andover, and that meant something so special to me because we had the countdown to, that countdown to takeover, I mean, mm -hmm. because the takeover was we got back to London and then Bristol, and eventually he got sort of better. I'm very, that is a heartwarming story uh, all round uh, for the health service in Hong Kong and of course for the Shangri-La Hotel. I promise you this, if I ever go to Hong Kong, I'm going to book into the Shangri-La oh, yes, uh, Hotel. Oh yes, George, uh, do it, that. It even sounds uh, heavenly. Have you ever been, you've been in Hong Kong? No, and I probably am going to conspicuously avoid it, not least because there was an ISIS-style torture conducted of a journalist who, uh, who works for a, 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 a newspaper rather that has published several of my own pieces on the occasion. This would be the Global Times declaring interest as it were, not that I have any financial ones. I'm doing I an interview don't. with the Chinese People's Daily tomorrow. Indeed, a sister publication. And so it's a real shame because Hong Kong is one of those places I've wanted to visit. And Norma, you're, uh, you had a front row seat to a deeply interesting and, and for impactful. much longer than you planned oh, for, yeah. so, for, for the wrong reasons. reasons yes. yeah. Very good. Well, uh, uh, the insurance paid thousands, George, thousands and thousands of pounds. And they didn't charge you? Well, they had a good insurance. <laughs> Oh well, oh, excellent. That yes. is, uh, it's always good to have a, a good insurance. Uh, now, it's a small place. I mean, I've been in the airport. I've never been in the city. Uh, but when you fly in to Hong Kong, you're practically looking into people's windows in their apartments, yeah. aren't you? You were, but I mean, they've got a new airport now. Oh, have they? Ah. This was in 1997. Um, yeah, it was scary, very scary landing. And then he had a stroke straight after. <laughs> oh, dear. I'm so sorry to hear that. But glad, that, okay. he, uh, glad that he recovered. He's still alive. He's still alive. Oh, We're God all bless. still alive by the grace of God. Fag Ash Flo on Twitter. <laughs> Follower. Thank you very much indeed, Norma, uh, for your call. Uh, I just wanted to finish up. Tamar, what's my out time? 59.20. I've got two minutes and ten seconds. Just to uh, ask you uh, this, the uh, 
government, I summarized in a way the British position in an earlier call. They're serious, aren't they? Uh, Boris Johnson's serious about leaving without a deal if the EU will not renegotiate Mrs May's disastrous deal. Uh, in which case, do you think the EU is going to back down? I personally do, because I cannot see how it can be in the interest of European business, European capital, to wreck their trade with us when they sell us much more than we sell them. Your view? Well, the, the heads of Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen and Siemens will be hot under the collar because they'll be telling Mrs. Merkel and they'll be telling uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, who's very unpopular in Germany, to do exactly what you're saying. If you were to ask me this morning, I would have said yes, the EU will do some 11th hour concession saying let's have an FTA or something similar or let's agree to a proto-FTA under the GATT rules and then we'll negotiate an FTA in short order. Nigel Farage, however, who has spent a lot of time physically in the belly of the beast with these people like Juncker and the rest of him, he thinks they won't back down. He thinks that they'll cut off their nose to spite their face. In, in any case, Boris Johnson will either be a very successful Prime Minister or the worst actor we've ever seen. Well, we'll I wonder soon. which it will be. Uh, no doubt, uh, God willing, the mother of all talk shows will bring you every twist and turn in the next months up till October 31. It's only 74 days, I think, 73 Blimey. days uh, to go. Well, it's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back next week and bring another listener with you. Thanks for watching and listening. We are above all the latest developments and we don't take any sides. Radio Sputnik, telling the untold. Radio Sputnik, we speak your language. Find us at sputniknews.com.